Right, so, um, hello, uh, good evening and welcome to Glasgow Skeptics Hustings for this, u this year's uh, European parliamentary elections. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Glasgow Skeptics is a grassroots, not-for-profit organisation committed to promoting science, uh, critical thinking, understanding and freedom of expression. Uh, we host fortnightly, free fortnightly public understanding and public engagement event events like this. Uh, we recently hosted the largest free and open debate on Scottish independence organised by neutral organisation. Uh, more than 400 people filled the Mitchell Theatre to hear the debate and we did have to turn a large crowd away as well. Hey. Hey. Um, we don't receive money from any other bodies, and that includes the government. Um, it's also very important to us that the event continue to remain free uh, so that any interested party can attend. We continue to exist and to be able to hold events like these uh, only through the generosity of our audiences, and uh, more on that later. Um, tonight will work a little differently from most of our events. Uh, each candidate will have up to five minutes uh, to make their opening remarks, uh, and I would ask all candidates to stick to that. Uh, as a forewarning, and in their interest of fairness, you will be cut off af after six. Um, we will then open the floor to audience questions. Um, if you would rather uh, not uh, be recorded by the camera, um, then do just uh, make that clear, and you can be edited out or whatever later. Just um, in case the bailiffs are looking for them. No, no, no. Nothing, none of that. Um, in terms of uh, asking questions, in, in the interest of uh, brevity, um, please do keep them brief. I will repeat the audience the question back to the audience so it can also be picked up by the microphones and by the cameras. Um, I have asked each candidate to keep their answer to less than two minutes uh, because we expect that there will be a large number of questions and discussion. Uh, there isn't really time to take a structured break as we normally would, uh, so please do feel free to head to the bar uh, to refill your glass at any time. Uh, there are toilets located at the back and also upstairs. Uh, there are also fire exits in the corner at the back and uh, back at the stairs that you came down. And where are the life jackets? The life jackets, we have none, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Drown. Hopefully we won't need them. <laughs> um, I will now introduce our candidates uh, in a previously determined random order in which they will also be speaking. Well, I did the list, there you go. Um, so representing Labour, uh, we have Catherine Styler, MEP. Uh, Catherine has been MEP for Scotland since 1999 and is number two on the Labour Party list. Uh, from the United Kingdom Independence Party, uh, we have David Coburn. Uh, David is number one on the UKIP list. Uh, Tazmina Ahmed Sheikh, who many of you will have heard from recently at our debate on Scottish independence, um, is here to represent the Scottish National Party. Uh, Tazmina is number three on the SNP party list, and as such will be hoping to become the SNP's third MEP this year. Uh, George Lyon, MEP, is the Liberal Democrat MEP for Scotland and is number one on the Liberal Democrat party list. He has been MEP for Scotland since 2009 and before that, from 99 to 2007, he was the MSP for Argyll and Butte. Uh, Maggie Chapman is a councillor for the Leith Ward Walk at the City of Edinburgh Council uh, and has been since 2007. Um, she is the co-convener of the Scottish Green Party and is number one on the Scottish Green Party list. And finally, uh, Jamie Gardner is here to represent the Scottish uh, Conservatives. Uh, he was the president of the Oxford University Conservatives, Conservative Association and is number four on the Scottish Conservatives party list. Please do welcome our candidates. Thank you. Uh, in keeping with uh, the Electoral Commission guidance, uh, I will take this opportunity to highlight that uh, Britain First, the British National Party and uh, No to EU were not invited to take part in the Sussings event. Uh, this is due to their lack of political representation and their lack of local prominence. Uh, the BNP received 2.5% of the vote in 2009, No to EU received 0.9%, uh, whilst Britain First was only founded in 2011. A recent ICM poll of 1,004 people found that uh, only 12 people plan to vote for a party uh, or a candidate not represented here tonight. And that is why uh, the aforementioned three parties have not been included. Um, as I said at the very top, Basel Skeptics is committed to uh, freedom of expression, uh, not just for the speakers, but for our fellow audience members as well. Um, freedom of expression, as long as you agree with me, uh, doesn't really cut it. <laughs> So if you do think that you might find yourself shouting over other speakers to the point of silencing or intimidating them, then I would suggest that tonight's event is not for you and to consider removing yourself. Hopefully we won't have any of that. Um, if you do have any concerns or comments at any point in the evening, please do feel free to approach anybody wearing a name tag. Um, if you are wearing a name tag or would be happy to... Brian, for instance, Emily, Tim, if you have your name tags, make yourselves available. <laughs> um, so, anyway, uh, the hashtag for tonight's event is GSEP2014. That's uh, GS for Glasgow Skeptics, EP for European Parliament, and 2014 for the Year of Our Lord. Uh, please do tweet along. Um, I have just noticed that my notes um, are somewhat abridged. 
I'm sure there were more. Uh, I had more important things to say as well, but we're going to have to move on. Um, so, uh, moving straight on, uh, I would like to invite uh, Labour's Catherine Styler to make her opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Yeah. With a microphone, it's probably easier. Just to ask that question. If, if you'd like to, if you'd like to stand, stand. If you'd like to stay seated, stay seated. Well, I'll, I'll stay seated then if you want to keep. Okay. Seated. Here we go. But uh, anyway, Labour in these elections, it's great to be here this evening, and I think it's a great uh, uh, opportunity to have some debate uh, two days away from us uh, going to vote on Thursday. So for the Labour Party, we sit in the Socialist Group in the Parliament, we stand in a common manifesto across 28 uh, different uh, countries, and our manifesto has as its main priority jobs, jobs and jobs. 27 million people across the European Union are currently unemployed, I think one in four of those are young people, and this is something we, we feel in the Socialist Group and in the Labour Party is unacceptable in Scotland. At the moment, there's 20.6% of young people who are unemployed, and these statistics are, so, are, 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 are things which we have to change. So within the socialist group, we want to see a new industrial policy. We want to see uh, green jobs and green growth. I sit in the single market committee in the parliament, and we see that uh, the digital single market is something that has not been completed, and we want to see that completed. Currently, there are 900,000 uh, ICT jobs going uh, free across the European Union and we don't have the skills within the European Union to fit those jobs. So we have to take some action to try and address where we have skill shortages to try and make sure those people who are not in work can find work and the ICT sector is somewhere I think that we need to take action upon. We also believe that you cannot just have a single market without good social rights and workplace rights are absolutely essential. What we've seen over the past uh, little while in the European Union is a uni European Union focused on austerity, a European Union run by the right, and we think within the Labour Party and within the Socialist Group we can change that. And in these elections, it's interesting, I sit in a group of 195 MEPs, and if the polls are looking right, we are very close, if not capable, of beating the European Parliamentary People's Party to be the largest group in the Parliament in this election. What that means is if the socialist group get the largest number of MEPs, we then determine the political flavour of the head of the European uh, Commission. So it does matter, every single vote in this election matters, and who you elect to represent you in the Parliament matters, partly because of this new system as well, but also because size and strength matters, sitting in a group of 195 MEPs and possibly being the largest group in the next Parliament, we have that is very different from the other political parties who are represented here uh, tonight. But on workplace rights, on precarious work such as zero hours contracts and on other precarious work, we believe that we can take action across the European Union working together in the socialist group. Also, another priority for us is on tax uh, evasion. One trillion euros in tax evasion. If we could get that money back, just think what we could do across the European Union to fund our public services. And sadly, uh, some parties here represented this evening when it came to a tax avoidance uh, vote did not support action on this at a European level. I think we can only do this if we work together, and certainly within the social group we want to see this. I will not speak for too long, but finally, we sit here in 2014. In 1914, as we know, was the beginning of the First World War. We sit here in 2014, and the European Union does need reform. We should never forget that it is the most successful peace process, that what countries of their own free will come together and try and work together to solve common problems. And it's been a privilege to represent Scotland for the past 15 years, and it would be a great honour to return to represent Scotland in what I believe is the most successful peace process this world has ever known. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine, very much for sticking to the time. Uh, we do now move on to David Coburn of UKIP. David? Well, it's very nice to be here in my home city of Glasgow. I went to school round the corner here at the Glasgow High School. Um, I'm a freeman of the city of Glasgow, which is a, a great honour, which I hold very dear to myself. Um, UKIP are, as you know, opposed to the European Union for very good reasons. We're libertarians. Uh, the European Union is not a democratic organisation, cannot be, never will be, it's too big, too cumbersome, and we simply can't make it work in the same way a, a parliament could work. Um, the 
problems have been you can all see by the currency that they've got the the euro which has been a disaster for Europe is not a, a real currency it's a political currency which is probably why it doesn't work uh, at the moment we have a million people marched on Madrid uh, we have co well, Molotov cocktail parties in Athens uh, Italy is going bust. The, the Venetian Republic is, is, is separating from Italy. In matter of fact, if I don't get elected uh, to the European Parliament, I think I'm running for Doge of Venice. But um, whatever, it, all I can say is that Europe is not doing well under the Euro. It's not doing well under the European Union. Uh, I think that we need to get out of it. We need to be able to trade with the rest of the world, not just with sclerotic, dying European corps, which simply does not work. We need to be dealing with the Far East, we need to be dealing with, um, with India, South America, we need to be able to deal with the rest of the world and not just with Europe. And Scotland needs to be attached to England to do that. Together, we have been together for 400 years or 300 years and a bit, and um, you know, together we work well, we've had a good currency, a stable currency, we work well in peace and war, we've given the, wor the world uh, liberal democratic government not that they've always kept it but at least we gave it to them before we left and quite frankly we created the greatest power the world has ever known so you know together we work better than on our own why Mr. Salmond would want us on our own I simply cannot understand economically it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever the only sense it makes is to make him prime minister rather than first minister that seems to be the only thing or el presidente or whatever he wants to be um, I personally would do anything to prevent Scotland breaking away from England. I think it's been our, in our interest for so long. If we go that, down that route, it can only lead to a loss of jobs. It's going to lead to loss of businesses. I think the people of Scotland are much more interested in seeing business grow in Scotland, getting the burden of taxation, regu regulation off the backs of Scottish entrepreneurs most of you I can see here are young and pretty with it, so you know that the future is not big corporations and all the rest of it, it's small companies growing. You know that, I know that. And we need to get big, the corporation, the, the, the ta tax off our backs, not only in Holyrood, but in Westminster and Brussels. That is what Scots need. We need a thriving economy. We need the Scotland of you know, Adam Smith and Andrew Carnegie, not, you know, sort of the socialist Keir Hardy or, or Red Robo, all that sort of nonsense. We need a Scotland that's going places. We need an education system that's fit for, to get young Scottish people, whatever their, their, their start in society. I went to Glasgow High School around the corner, you didn't have to pay for that, that was free. And the education there was as good as Eton. And two prime ministers emerged from that, that school. And quite frankly, uh, you know, that's something that I, I'm very proud to have been at that place and all the Labour Party and the Conservative Party together conspired to destroy schools like that like Alan Glenn's, all the rest of it they were either forced to become private or forced um, out of business altogether I want to see the young people in Scotland given the opportunity for that sort of an education if they're academic and I want to see young Scots who are not academic, that was the problem with the old system, once these Scots who are not academic, given other sort of things that are good for them, courses in engineering or in, 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 in hands-on sort of technology that suits their abilities, which may not be of a purely academic nature. And we also want to see the kids at the bottom of level of society given the opportunity to get on. You know, we need remedial schools, Kids should not be allowed to fail simply because they come from a lower sector of society. Everyone should be given an opportunity. It is disgusting to see kids coming out of school in Scotland at the age of 18 unable to read and write. That is not acceptable. I want to see the Scotland where Scots exported education to the world. We exported doctors and nurses. I hear, you know, we, people keep saying for the health service we need to import doctors and nurses from all over the world. Well, quite frankly, this country used to export doctors and nurses. And quite frankly, it's a disgrace we're minutes. not producing them. So I think we should be producing them here and exporting them to the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, David. And uh, now, Tasmina, on to you. Thanks very much. Chair Skeptics, we are less than 60 hours from the opening of the polls come Thursday's European elections themselves, four months away from the biggest decision this country will take in terms of our independence. And I am, of course, delighted 
to be amongst those for whom rigorous evidence-based decision-making will always take precedence. As a Glaswegian mother of four engaged in politics, business and law, it will be my pleasure to show that the very evidence produced by my counterparts this evening falls foul of the first jewel of scepticism on every test, whether it's the state of our resource-rich, people-driven economy or testimony that demolishes the unrelenting <coughs> scaremongering we hear on a daily basis. In the SNP, we are fighting this election on a manifesto that serves as a significant staging post on this country's journey towards fulfilment, which I believe can only be achieved with the full set of powers that comes with independence. Now, you won't need a microscope to test that premise, as my party, the Scottish National Party, launched its election manifesto at the world-leading animal health and welfare education facility at Moradon, precisely to emphasise the importance of being in the EU to scientific research, with half a billion euros in EU research funding secured by Scottish institutions since 2007. The evidence clearly demonstrates that the biggest threat to jobs and investment in Scotland comes from the mounting probability of an NI referendum called from Westminster. None of us here, of course, need on lab coats or goggles to tear holes in the scaremongering. Most of the fellow panellists here tonight will relentlessly deploy on everything from currency union to living wage. Labour will no doubt claim that Scotland will lose EU membership by voting yes in September, even as the second most senior MEP in Brussels, George, uh, David Martin. <laughs> not, not quite yet, not quite, not quite. <laughs> no, not quite. David Martin is quoted in yesterday's Sunday Herald interview as saying the exact opposite. Now it's your turn. The Liberal Democrats will no doubt peddle the same oldness, even as Sir Graham Watson, President of the Group of Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, similarly dismisses Project Fear. Of course, Scotland will be embraced as an independent EU nation. After all, where would the EU be without 60% of oil, oil and gas reserves, 25% of its renewables potential, world-class academia, innovation or vital fish stocks? And Scotland will meet the timescale set out in Scottish Government's white paper. To conclude negotiations on a referendum result, Westminster is bound to accept bound by the Edinburgh Agreement, signed by Alex Salmond and David Cameron. The UK government's very own legal advisor, Professor James Crawford, said that the 18-month window estimated is realistic. European Commission Honorary De Director General Graham Avery, who actually crafted 14 EU enlargement applications, says that Article 48 of the Treaty of the European Union would be the legal basis for Scotland's EU membership, and that common sense dictates that Scotland stays in from day one. This election allows Scotland to send our strongest possible team and a signal that we want all of our citizens, whether Pakistani, Romanian, German, or of any origin whatsoever, to English. have representation English. at the heart of Europe by a party that will always put their interests first. We in the Scottish National Party want to see a more democratic, fair and prosperous Scotland. We want women to drive economic growth with a revolution in childcare provision that will become the envy of Europe, just like our rock-solid and long-proven commitment to funding education here in Scotland. Our equality agenda is paramount. Equality for all, regardless of age, disability, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion, belief, sex, and sexual orientation. And only the SNP will work to ensure our commitment to a living wage is enshrined in public contracts around Europe. Jobs and investment in Scotland are, are our priority. And 2014 Skeptics is indeed Scotland's year. The SNP in government and in the European Parliament has fought hard for Scotland, only to be let down by Westminster putting their own agenda before Scotland's needs. These elections are about two choices facing the people of Scotland. The choice between an inclusive, welcoming and socially just Scotland that the SNP want to see and the dismal anti-European, anti-devolution and anti-immigration anti agenda that UKIP is promoting and the Westminster parties are pandering to. 
the SNP speaks for Scotland and only for Scotland. Only a vote for a strong team of SNP MEPs in May and indeed a yes vote in September will let Scotland make our mark in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tasmina. Uh, we do now move on to George. Uh, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, and good evening. And uh, could I first of all say a big thank you for, to so many of you for taking the time to come along uh, and listen to the debate here tonight. I think this is the big hus biggest audience we've had at any hustings, so thank you very much uh, for, for making that uh, possible. Uh, your chairman suggested there might be 400 here, so I was wondering how they're all going to get into the, to the Admiral pub. But, uh, anyway, thank you for, for coming along. Uh, I'm George Lyon, I'm the Liberal uh, MEP currently. Uh, I'm part of the third biggest political group in European Parliament, which is the uh, Liberal Democrat group. Uh, we, are set, we are third to the Socialist and the centre-right party, the EPP. None of the political groups have a majority. Uh, and therefore, uh, quite often, we are the uh, key players in terms of which way the votes uh, go in the uh, European Parliament voting, uh, because it's a split uh, chamber, proportional chamber, uh, and as, as the third biggest, we, we quite often uh, are the, the key votes in that, uh, that uh, voting. We believe that this election is about jobs and economic recovery. Why? Well, quite simply, there are over 3 million UK jobs linked to the e uh, membership of the EU, over 300,000 in Scotland. Uh, we are currently the fastest growing economy uh, in, of the G7 countries, indeed of all the developed world. And we believe that any risk to breaking up either Britain or indeed breaking up the, the EU, as the UK uh, candidate would like to see, would put at risk these jobs and would put at risk the economic recovery. We are firmly against the divisive politics of UKIP, and we have seen that uh, our leader, Nick, uh, a, a Nick Clegg, Nick is that only, is that only, at least I didn't mix him up with David Martin, <laughs> uh, at least he has had uh, the courage to take on UKIP face to face and face down. And uh, lose badly. The divisive, <laughs> the divisive barrier throwing up rhetoric and their uh, attempts. Uh, to separate out communities within the United Kingdom. Uh, we believe that the key challenges, is, as I say, are jobs and economic recovery. Uh, that's what's top of every person's uh, agenda and concerns uh, across the United Kingdom and Scotland. We believe that we need to build on the reforms that were achieved in the last Parliament. Uh, that is the form of the budget, where we saw an overall cut in the budget, a £6 billion reduction in the overall cost of running the European administrations and big extra spending in education and transport and tackling youth unemployment. They should be the big priorities uh, in Europe going forward because we need to rebuild the economies of Europe. We want to see further reform in the energy sector that would see lower prices to Scottish consumers and put, open up huge opportunities for Scottish renewables and Scottish oil and gas with a single energy market. We want to see the service sector opened up as well with a single service sector where Scottish businesses could take advantage of their competitive advantage there uh, and that would complete or start to complete the single market which is so important. We also want to see the free trade deals com completed with the United States which again would help the economies of Europe recover. Why is it important that we see economic recovery across Europe? Well quite simply 50% of all the, our exports from Scotland and the exports from the United Kingdom go into Europe Without recovery in, in the rest of the European Union, then we cannot sustain the economic recovery we're starting to see uh, grow here in the United Kingdom and indeed in Scotland. The big challenge, two other big challenges going forward is to sort out the problems of the Eurozone area, where the uh, monetary union has failed because of the lack of political and fiscal union. And we should draw the lessons of that failure to some of the debates around an independent Scotland and what kind of policy it might use going forward. And finally, we need to complete banking union and reform of the financial sector. Never again can we allow our financial sector and our banks to wreck the finances of all the countries of the Western world. Our banks wrecked our economies. We need to put in place tough regulation to make sure that can never happen again. And that includes the rules that we have put in place that limit bonuses to bankers. 
So the big challenge going forward, I think, is to build consensus, to build togetherness across Europe. We do not believe in the politics of putting up barriers where none need to exist. We believe we are better off together in Britain, together in the European Union, and we're the only party putting forward a positive agenda to stay in Britain and in the European Union if we want to secure the jobs and economic recovery that is so important to all of our peoples across the United Kingdom and here in Scotland. Thank you very much indeed. That was a bang on five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, we shall now move on to Maggie uh, from the Green Party. Maggie. Thank you, Ian. And good, e good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak here and for being here yourselves. My name is Maggie Chapman, and I am a Green Councillor in Edinburgh and also a lecturer in Geography and Environmental Philosophy at Edinburgh Napier University. I'm very pleased to be here, and I look forward to your questions and, answer, uh, questions and debate and discussion later on. These European elections and the following five-year parliamentary term offer a significant opportunity to change the future of our continent and our world. Scottish Greens stand for a just and welcoming Scotland, a Scotland which takes its place as an equal among European nations, which works for peace and plays a responsible role in the world and which entrusts power to the people. For most people, the economic crisis is far from over. Wages have stagnated, jobs are less secure than ever. Food costs, house prices, energy bills are all rising. This is not only bad for the people it affects, but it is bad for our economy and it is bad for our politics. Scottish Greens stand for a different kind of politics, a different kind of Europe, where power is handed down to the local level, but countries work together for flourishing public services and for decent conditions and wages for ordinary people. Where people from other countries who choose to live and work here and enhance our society are welcomed, and where we play a responsible role in other parts of the world, especially those caught up in conflict. In order to achieve this, we need to wrest power from the unelected, unaccountable commission. We need to reform way beyond the structural reform most people talk about. We need to deal with the economic crisis in a way that does not hand even more power to corporations. We must, we must invest in jobs that deliver energy security, sustainable housing, and that pay a living wage. We should enshrine social security for all in European legislation. And we must work to make further and higher education a right across Europe. The European Union has a key role in supporting research, funding infrastructure, facilitating academic collaborations through things like Horizon 2020 and other funding projects. Part of delivering our just economy for our future must be to focus on the knowledge economy. Advancing our understanding of the world is vital to meeting global challenges like climate change and disease conditions like HIV and AIDS. We believe that the advancement of human knowledge has intrinsic value and must not be captured by corporations. Rather than restricting access to knowledge in medicine or renewable, energy, renewable technologies, for example, to large business interests, we must ensure such knowledge is part of a collective treasury used for the common good. We support a step change in the public funding of research and in return we, we expect the subsequent discoveries to be easily available to the public. We must ensure that we stand firm by the European principle of freedom of movement. As an immigrant myself, I care very much how we treat people, regardless of where they are from, what colour skin they have. But it is not just the moral case for immigration that must be made. The interests of immigrants and those of our economy are often very, very closely aligned. Fear of immigrants down south is being used to make it more difficult to fill skill shortages. We know that immigrants are essential to our economy, never mind our culture. For example, £22 billion contributed to public finances since 2001, according to University College of London research. And we, Greens, can state very clearly that our vision for Scotland's future is one of peace. We can oppose the militarisation of Europe and say no to nuclear alliances, opting instead for a future of peace building. So these elections offer us opportunities to recreate politics for people, to defend public services and offer a new approach to social security, 
to stand up for immigrants and to oppose military aggression. A green vote signals your rejection of messages of hatred of the vulnerable, fear of the other, and makes a positive statement, a statement of hope for a better Scotland in a better Europe. Thank you. Well, uh, this whole cheering thing is going uh, quite well so far. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, finally, uh, we do have Jamie Gardner of the Conservative Party. Jamie, you have five minutes. Thank you. OK, well, thank you. I'll try not to ruin it for you. Um, thank you very much for giving up your beautiful early summer's evening to come here. I think it's true to say, and we'd all admit, that not everybody is as engaged with the European election as we might like. And it's fantastic to be in a room full of people who, who have made the effort. Um, I'm not going to be able to paraphrase, and I, I think you'll be glad that I don't try, the Conservative manifesto into five minutes. But what I would like to try and do is make two points, um, which I think are at the core of our position. And the first one is that we believe that Europe's unbalanced and it needs to be changed and reformed. And the second one is that not only is the position worse than it should be now, but separation of Scotland would make it even worse. And I'm going to try to elaborate a bit on those, uh, on those points and then we'll have questions afterwards. So the first point about the imbalance, what do, I, um, what do I mean when I say imbalance? Well, I think there are two types of imbalance. There's a, a, a financial imbalance, and that's that for all the good things that Europe does, and we've heard about some of them tonight, it, it's pretty unequivocal that we pay in more than we get back through European programs. And that's a, that's a, a bad thing that disadvantages Scotland and disadvantages Britain. Now, the second area of imbalance is what I would call democratic imbalance. And that's that there are some things that we might approve of. Um, and we had um, a, a lot of the policy ideas that, that Catherine and that Maggie were talking about, for example. Now, it's not a question of whether you agree with them or disagree with them. It's a question of whether you think they should be happening at a European level. Because what's different about the European level to the Scottish level or the British level is that if you don't like it and you want to change it, there's nothing you can do, because it's determined by um, an, an unelected commission in the parliament whose composition is primarily um, set by, by countries outside this country. Um, so my position is that we need change of that. Now, every party says that we need change. Every party at every election in the history of the world has said that we need change, and we've said it in the European Union since we joined. I think what's distinctive this time is that the Conservatives are actually offering something different, which is that we're going to try and renegotiate the position and then we believe that we can get a better position, but as the check and the balance against that, we're going to have a referendum. So at the very, very worst, this institution that lost so much of its credibility, it's going to be put to the people again, and the decision is going to rest, not with the politicians and the panel, but, um, but, but with the people in Scotland and in Britain. And I think that's a fundamentally good thing. So that's the unbalanced point, but, but we need change. The second point that I would make is that separation is going to make things worse. And it kind of splits into stuff that we know and stuff that we don't really know. So going through some of the things that we know for sure first, we know that Scotland would have to renegotiate entry into the European Union. That's absolutely clear. And it, it, you only need to think about this. In the treaties at the moment, Scotland doesn't figure, the United Kingdom figures. So if Scotland leaves the United Kingdom, we have to renegotiate entry. Now, you can argue whether that's easy, that's hard, but we have to renegotiate entry. Now, the second thing that I would argue that is pretty much certain, if it is absolutely certain, in fact, is that some of the things in that renegotiation we would lose. We would lose Scotland's share of the UK rebate, for example. There's no way on earth, I don't even think the SFP would argue, that that would be replicated um, again. We would lose the VAT exemptions that Britain has in certain goods, like food, like kids' clothing, um, like, like books. And we know that because the head of the, the, the European Tax Office said that that was the case. So those are things that we know we would lose. Now, the SNP may argue, well, and, and the Greens may argue, well, there's another side to that. There's another side to the ledger. We'd be able to get, get, back to comp get stuff back to compensate for that. And that all falls into the, the category of things that I would say are very uncertain. And what I would ask you to do is just think about how likely it is. Now, the European budget's already been set out to 2020. So what that means is that what the SNP is saying is that they would have to send their negotiators into Europe, and in 18 months, which is the length they've given us to, to negotiate entry, which is hugely short compared to some of the other countries that have joined the EU recently, we would be able not just to get a, a deal for Scotland on existing terms, 
but that we would be able to take money off people who have already banked that money because it's been agreed in the, the latest budget. <coughs> And we would agree, and we would get them to agree that that would be redistributed towards um, towards Scotland. Now, maybe it's not conceptually impossible, but it would be the most successful negotiation in the history of the European Union, <laughs> possibly in the history of Europe. Yes, the world. And I, I, I think it is therefore reasonable to say um, that that the position would get worse because we would be the supplicants, we would be the ones going and asking to be let in. Every other country would have the veto. So, just to, to sum up really quickly, five minutes. I, I'm out of five minutes, I'm going to shut up very quickly. Okay. First point, I think there's a lot wrong with Europe, um, it needs to be changed, we need a plausible strategy to, to change it, and that's the referendum. And the second point is that if we were to become separate and had to renegotiate entry, things would become even worse. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we are now going to move on to uh, audience uh, questions and panellist answers. Um, if anybody has a question, uh, then please do stick up your hand, and if you think I can't see you, which would especially be people up the back, uh, then uh, wave a bit harder. Uh, I will come to some audience regulars uh, later, but <laughs> first um, I'll take the uh, person up back there, yes. Yes, you. No? Yes, you. Sorry. I'm sorry, uh, do keep it brief and I will try and um, relay it back to the rest of the audience as well. Thank you. With climate change accelerating at the pace, is it not time that you introduced a legally binding, far more ambitious climate change policy and penalise countries that refuse to move away from fossil fuels? So uh, the question was, uh, with climate change uh, uh, at the pace that it is, is it not time that the European Union um, enforced, uh, adopted a legally binding uh, climate change targets and penalised countries that refuse to move away from the status quo, I suppose. Um, George, go to you first. Yes. 40% yeah. should be the target, and that's been discussed already, with maybe move, moving to possibility of moving to 50% reduction in uh, climate change gases. Uh, the debate is about how that should be achieved. There is a proposal from the Commission at the moment uh, whether you should leave countries to be able to decide how they best achieve that target, or whether you set three targets at an EU level as to which areas they then have to, to uh, make progress in. Uh, I lean towards the, f the first proposal that says you set the targets, you then allow the country to decide which is the best mix between renewables, uh, between insulation, uh, etc., to try and uh, meet these climate change targets. But the answer to your question is yes. Thank you, George. Uh, we will just move along the panel, I suppose. Uh, so, uh, Maggie, on to you next. Yes, absolutely, we need to do this. What we need to do is ensure that we stop subsidising fossil fuel industries. We've been doing that for far too long. And that, that's something that cannot continue if we are to truly decarbonise decarbonize our, our economy. It's very interesting that the, the, something published very recently within the last week, Germany has managed to secure 74% of its energy supply from renewables and that's because they have invested over the last 30 or 40 years in a whole range of, re of renewable infrastructure that is something that the British government has completely failed to do and that, that's something that we have to change and they, they should absolutely be, be, be much more stringent targets and, and penalties as long as, the, we, but we do need to make sure that the penalties actually fall in the right places and that they aren't brought down to, to, the, to people on the ground because it's not people's faults. It, it's, it's the fault of governments and it's the fault of uh, corporations. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tasmina, over to you. Thank you. Um, absolutely. I mean, energy security is one of the key issues um, of the moment and we all have a responsibility to be providing um, and making provision um, for the future. I mean, the Scottish Government, as you'll know, is absolutely committed uh, to climate change policy. We've met, we will meet 50% of our renewables target on course by 2015, which is a massive achievement, and by 2020, which is a target we will have achieved, um, all things going well, and we're on target to do so, 100% um, renewable energy here in Scotland. So I think, yeah, indeed. Uh, so in terms of uh, climate change, absolutely we should do whatever we can. Mm. It is the key issue of the future. Okay, speeding things along. David. <coughs> well, there's always been climate change. Remember the Ice Age, ladies and gentlemen? Remember the Ice Age? Um, I, I used to climb up glaciers and plant Yoklamerki 
uh, trying to find out. <laughs> when I was at school, we thought there were going to be adva advances of glaciers, and we were going to another ice age. Well, that's still the case. Most uh, intelligent scientists would tell you that we are heading towards another ice age. Um, the new, the how should we put the wind farm industry, the 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 carbon industry, the whole shebang that these people get tremendously vexed about. Quite frankly, is unproven. Um, I am the first guy in the world to, I mean, I really believe in green stuff. You know, I, I like, you know, <laughs> you never get a guy more green than me. I have, I have more compost heaps than you can shake a stick at. You know, I, I really like farming. I like all the, I, I don't have central heating in my home. I just don't believe in it, quite frankly. So there you are. And Definitely I don't think the vast majority of the population would, would agree with me. Uh, because they want central heating and they won't vote for anything other than that. The great granddaddy of the Greens, Professor James Lovelock, said that the only interim way of dealing with these matters is nuclear power. And he was absolutely on the button. Now all the Green people, my vegetarian friend down there and, and Jasmine, I'm sure everybody else, they're all... Tasmina. Oh, Tasmina, sorry. Um, they all get themselves in a tremendous flurry about all this. But Professor Lovelock was a great granddaddy of the Greens, perfectly sensible man, and he said, in the meantime, until we have some... Until we have nuclear fusion, we need to have nuclear power. It's the only way around it. Anybody else says otherwise is talking through their hat. And covering Scotland, Scotland's beautiful countryside, in German propellers, I can assure you, is not going to improve our tourist industry. No one will come hundreds of miles to look at German propellers. And I don't think a lot of people are going to vote for them, especially if they're next to their houses, and it's going to devalue their houses. Laugh as you might. Uh, those people have votes and they have they have saved up for their home uh, they minutes. don't want something hideous outside their doors thank you uh, Catherine over to you thank you for your question I agree and I think Mr. Pan and David agreed about binding uh, targets but I think one of the things that we'll have to improve upon is how the member states work on climate change issues because we're moving towards that important uh, year of 2015 where uh, the climate change debate and the conference will be held, where other, where you know, internationally things will be discussed, and also Connie Hellegaard, who's been the the, 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 the um, commissioner responsible for climate change, she has been quite frankly sidelined in a lot of issues. And I think within the commission there has to be a better way of working on climate change. You have an environment commissioner, uh, uh, Connie Hellegaard, you know, from the Danish the Danish commissioner, and that will change in the next parliament as well. So I do think that. Um, I mean, I've been working on construction products, take that as an example, and there's been, you've got the uh, in industry commissioner working on that, you've got uh, climate change issues on one side, and yet yeah, everything has to be better coordinated. And I think there's a real need within the commission to have a, we talk about reform, but really in the commission, there has to be a better way of working on these issues where all of that is integrated. If we really are serious about climate change, we need to have binding targets, but we also have to be serious about energy efficiency. I think it's been a touch about security of supply. All of these different issues have to be worked and coordinated together. And at the moment, I think that there's, there's a job of work to be done in the next commission to make that actually happen. So thank you for your question. Okay. Thank you. Oh dear, hold on. Uh, that's a different arm. Um, and uh, Jamie, to you. Okay, so should we tighten up um, green policy at a European level? My answer to that actually is no. And the reason that I say no is because Europe is quite simply too small. And there are three reasons that I would give um, in, in justifying this. So the first point is that um, this is something that has to be tackled at a global level. And something done unilaterally by Europe is actually not going to make the kind of difference that we would seek it to make. It has to be done at a global level. The second point is that if we set our climate policy uh, now, then it means that we have got less um, to negotiate with when we go into these global negotiations, which are going to be decisive and whether we can actually make something meaningful happen. And then the third point is that if Europe um, tightens up its green, um, its green rules before um, that's matched in uh, in other parts of the, the world, like the United States. Or China. Then, then what we're going to see is an outflow of manufacturing jobs from Europe to these other parts of the world, um, which again is going to have a little effect at a, a net level, because the same stuff is still going to be produced, but it's going to asymmetrically damage um, Europe's economy. So I'm not saying that we should do nothing about it, but I'm saying that Europe isn't the right forum um, to, to do it. Can you surely that. working together with 28 countries and a common position going into these international negotiations gives us much greater strength? No? 
No, that's, because the European the Union's got its own issue. That is the point at stake. No, no, no the European together. Union Pollution is... Pollution knows no boundaries. Climate change knows no boundaries. If we don't work together across the EU, we won't get to see some of these things we want well, to I'm see. Well, I'm not saying... But the European Union is doing that. Can I let Jamie respond? It should not be done by bureaucrats. It should be done by political politicians. Uh, my very oh, quick does the NEP say we can decide? Well, you won't make that decision. <laughs> my, my very the European Parliament's a unit. David, it's let Jamie speak. Can we let Jamie speak? Thank you. Not. Can we let Jamie speak, please? Okay, after all that build up, I don't actually have much to say. <laughs> <laughs> my, my point isn't that we should be doing it at a, a national level. Um, uh, like Catherine said, that, that's insufficient. We need to go into these bigger arenas. My point is that to actually make a meaningful difference about this, we have to do it at a global level, and people who talk about mm. European climate policy are actually thinking too small. But surely the problem with the argument you're putting forward, James, is that you're saying then because no one else will do anything, we should do nothing. I mean, that's an argument for, for uh, continuing global warming. No, because all you're doing is putting money in the, in the, in the pockets of layers. Chance, could you trouble, John, is why you're going to lose your seats, because you don't listen to the public. That's why you're going to lose it. <laughs> I think the more we let you speak, that might not be the case. Can I finish just the the point I wanted to make? Because it's a real important point here. If the European Union doesn't put the fiscal drivers in place and the, the legislative drivers in place to try and develop a new green agenda that actually acts as a world leader in developing the new technology that will fuel us in the future, then we are missing a trick because I think there's a tremendous opportunity there that if we encourage the industry and we develop the industry here in Europe, then other countries will buy our technology. So we need sensible targets, we need sensible incentives to make sure that we end up as world leaders in developing the technology of the future. And, and if I can just yep. butt in very quickly, there, there is a very, very good economic argument for this. Germany has one of the, is, is I think the most. Um, per capita has the highest manufacturing economy in, in the world and it is driven by renewable um, infrastructure and renewable development. So, so that it's good for our economy to be doing this across, across Europe. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, just to add that with independence, of course we have, as I, as I said, I'm open to Mark, substantial energy resources and with a balance of generation mix we will you know, we can be sure of security of supply so we're very fortunate what we have in Scotland um, in terms of our uh, energy um, renewables at 25% and 10% um, of wave potential as well. Okay uh, we will move on um, sort of I reckon I do see that Gary has a question and I, I know that Gary has a, a bugbear at the moment so um, <laughs> keep it brief um, and we may we'll see how it goes. Gary. It's a related question to the last one. I was just picking up on the point that George made there about what is the next advance in energy technology going to be. Uh, picking up on what Maggie said as well about the importance of technology and, and, and uh, information for its own sake, and what Tasmina said about uh, you know, the next um, sort of the, the advancement of the service sector industry. So we're going to need energy to do all this, and the renewables aren't yet to the base at the moment. I'm sad to see that the only person who seems to be putting forward Maggie tonight is the UKIP candidate. By the way, you're not getting my vote. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as long as you agree with me, I'm happy. The, Thank you. The order the candidates get my vote tonight, they need to tell me that they're going to support nuclear power in the interim until we can get the uh, new... Can I answer this? Um, well, yes, actually, first of all. Uh, oh. so, um, so the question was, for those who didn't hear, um, in agreement with lots of what uh, the previous, uh, previous candidates have said, um, technology is... Uh, what is uh, going to, uh, well, Gary will uh, vote for whoever can promise him that uh, they will support nuclear power in the interim until renewable energy is properly developed. And uh, David, sorry, David can uh, go first. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to disturb Gary's night and uh, I'm disturbed with the fact he agrees with me. Um, but <laughs> quite frankly, he's, he's absolutely on the button. We can't go back to the Middle Ages. People will not, voters, people out there who are putting their cost in the ballot paper will not accept living in a mud art with no central heating, no this, no that. It just won't happen. If you want to make people, if, if, if global warming is correct, and I, I, you know, I, I'm willing to listen, I'm not a scientist, but the thing is that what's very important is that if you want people to agree with that and go along with it, you have to give them a realistic alternative. And the only realistic alternative that doesn't throw us back to the Middle Ages is, quite frankly, nuclear power. And nuclear power, until such point, is we have nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is possible. It is going to happen. It is a question of time scaling it up to the right sort of side. When that's the case, then it will actually use the nuclear waste to power itself. So, 
I'm all for that. I'm for nuclear fusion in the long term and a nuclear, uh, you know, uh, our present nuclear, you know, what we've got for now. But we cannot tell the public that they have to put their electricity bills in. If you think you're going to sell, you know, increased electricity bills to pensioners in Scotland and get their vote, you're crazy. And that's the reason why today's daily record says that UKIP are going to win a seat in the Scottish MEP <laughs> vote. And quite frankly, that's what it's all about. Because these people cannot sell this nonsense to the other old lady who can't afford her electricity bill, the little old person who just simply cannot afford it. It's all very well for the, the middle classes of Edinburgh, the people in Morningside and Bears Den, but it ain't going to work for the normal people in Maryhill. Sorry. <laughs> I hope you're clapping there. <laughs> uh, we'll move that way. So, uh, Catherine, you now? Yeah, Gary, I, I believe in an energy mix, so although I would like to see everything uh, <clears throat> being much more green, I think that nuclear energy has to be part of the mix as it stands at the moment. So I think that uh, the question you pose is, is difficult for many of us, but I think at the end of the day, I visited Huntington Power Station um, a few weeks ago. It was really interesting to note that uh, because at the moment that the plans for no more nuclear in Scotland, there's uncertainty about what may happen in the future. But I think that the, the, the fact that we have to be serious about this question, and if we are serious about how we deliver energy, then I think we have to be serious about where we get that energy. And I have to say, much as it, I'd like to see everything being renewable, there has to be an energy mix. And part of that, and part of that is... Another convert to UKIP. <laughs> I very David. much doubt that, David. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, you know you have your own views. I certainly have my views. But I think it's part of an energy mix. Nuclear is part of that. OK, uh, Jamie. Yeah, I agree. I think nuclear is part of a balanced energy policy. Um, the only thing is, I guess I probably shouldn't admit this, since you said that your vote was um, going to be swung on it, mm -hmm. but I think that it's primarily going to be determined domestically rather than in the, the European Parliament. But nonetheless, yeah, I agree with you. Too. Excellent. Uh, George, on to you. Uh, the answer to your question is yes, we need a balanced mix of energy sources. Uh, and while there are some would argue that you can do it all with renewables, I don't think that's credible. Uh, we need a mix between uh, offshore wind, <coughs> onshore wind. Uh, we need to see if we can prove uh, wave technology, which at the moment is hugely expensive and, and commercially not viable, uh, but it needs to be explored. Uh, but uh, clearly nuclear has to be part of the mix, and uh, as you know, probably are aware, the coalition government has struck deals with, uh, with uh, one of the nuclear companies to build uh, new plants south of the border. So there has to be uh, a mix because you need base load to, to try and uh, balance up the, the, current, the current renewables. There may well be a breakthrough in the future that uh, if we can ever make wave energy uh, uh, commercially viable, but at the moment that's a huge challenge. And it does beg the question of how Scotland copes in terms of baseload if we're going for no nuclear at all in, in, in the future. Uh, Maggie, on to you. Thanks, Ian. If, if you look at what's happened in Finland, Finland invested very, very heavily in nuclear, and they have some of the most expensive energy in the world. Um, because their, their investment has been subject to massive delays, huge costs, whereas in Germany, as, as I said earlier, we, we, Germ Germany's reached 74% renewable production and it has, se has seen the unit cost of energy decline, do nothing but fall. And I think that's the kind of transition that we need to be making. And I, I say transition, you know, I think w one of the things, George talks about a reliable base load. Well, since the Fukushima disaster in, in Japan, a very, very safe nuclear infrastructure that was built, ha having huge repercussions across the Pacific Ocean. You, if, if you look at the scientific evidence on, 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 on nu nuclear pollution... Call, call in, people the nuclear yep. if, 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 you, if you look at what's, what's happened elsewhere since Fukushima, Germany has switched its base load to tidal and wave. Um, and uh, wind, and there is no reason that we can't do that as well as a transition. You know, nobody in the right mind. David. <laughs> I think one, one, one thing to be clear. The, the other thing I would say about nuclear power is that it is part of an old kind of energy production system where energy production is very centralised, where it, the, the control of it is often often corporatized. And what we actually need is a future in, in, in our energy supply that doesn't rely on vast centralized systems that then distribute through a grid, but locally 
uh, sourced uh, energy production that can actually deliver local need as local need ebbs and flows. And that, that lo it's much easier then to have community control, social control, public control over that energy supply. So, so I think the, the model of that huge centralized infrastructure is coming to an end. And what we need is a shift to local, local distribution and local supply, local production. So uh, on to Tasmina, and then we will have a few minutes back and forth uh, for discussion. Thank, thanks very much, Ian. Well, um, as I stated, we do obviously have substantial energy resources in Scotland and a balanced generation mix at present. But of course, we'd like to see moving to the future, and I think your question is about where we want to go in the future, where we want to go into the future as a world. We need to be looking at, at changing things and having renewable energy. It creates jobs, community empowerment. Um, it's where we want to go as a nation, and Scotland is very well placed uh, to take that forward. So as much as we may require currently to have this balanced generation mix, I don't believe that's the future because there's not going to be much left of the world if we don't move forward to the next generation um, of supply, uh, particularly facing um, security of supply, as I've mentioned, and Catherine has also um, talked about uh, moving into the future. Okay. Um, David, I, I hear that you had uh, you like to contribute something. Well, just simply just a few that, moments. Yeah, very quickly. That um, you know, if if we don't again, if we don't if we don't do something sensible that people are willing to buy into, then you might as well forget it. And people will simply not buy into green power. And you can see by by the, the number of votes that green people get that you get it's pitiful. And um, quite frankly, uh, I'm as much in favour of a clean planet. I don't want to breathe fumes and and disgusting things. You know, I I, I want a clean planet too. Uh, but I have to be practical and I have to do something that works. And, and everyone, I think, here agrees that nuclear power is the only future. And the, the trouble is, they didn't. Well, let's say to a lesser or greater extent. But the longer and the shorter of it is, they should have got on with it earlier. And they didn't do it earlier. And now the French are going to provide it because our governments didn't have the guts to tell their population they needed nuclear power earlier. Enough. Okay. And now we have no nuclear structure. Maggie, would you like to respond to that? No. Well, just in such <coughs> people that agree in such pitiful numbers that we have. <coughs> MSPs and councillors in Scotland and UKIP has none. Uh, not after next week. <laughs> George, you have something? I think there's an interesting question though uh, a, for the SNP to answer on this one. Currently, 30% of the green consumer uh, subsidies uh, paid for uh, by UK taxpayers uh, and, well, sorry, UK consumers of, of energy comes to Scotland to support a renewable industry. Uh, there's a huge question as to whether that would continue in the future if indeed we separate from the rest of the UK. Will consumers south the border be still willing to see that consumer taxes that they pay through their electricity price being sent to Scotland? And I think there's a real challenge there. Uh, as to whether that green union will continue after we get uh, if we, if we, if we voted for, for independence. I, I, mean, I mean, let's be clear, Scotland is a net exporter of electricity and we export um, electricity to England and Wales and in 2012, one quarter of the electricity generated here helped keep the lights on um, across the rest of the United Kingdom. So don't we need, think we need to be concerned about um, the relationship and, uh, in terms of how much the rest of the UK needs Scotland to keep the lights on? Uh, um, we'll have to move to Jamie. Jamie, do you have anything to say on that particular issue? Um, well, on the, the point that we've just heard, nobody disputes that the rest of the UK would carry on buying the electricity. The question is whether they would carry on subsidising the electricity. So. Okay. I do think we're going to have to move just on. Just very quickly, just uh, we are going to have to move on. Are, David, we're going to have to move oh, yeah. on. Sorry. Uh, yes, gentlemen in the hat. Yeah, just that point from Derek before I. Uh, ask my question. Uh, maybe Dave. David. David. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I get Jasmina wrong, so sorry. Well, that's it. Maybe your leader, uh, his German wife, might want to come up to Scotland and talk to the German wind turbines, or would you all be happy? No, she, she comes up regularly to go fishing, apparently. She's very keen on fishing. Okay, uh, do we have a question? Yes, well, okay, yeah. okay. Um, I'd just like to know the panel's position on fracking, and would you support stronger EU regulation of fracking? Could I see audience appetite for more discussion of energy or moving on to another topic? Who would like to hear a question about fracking? Could I hear a question about immigration and what, what the panel's view are across Europe and from global context, please? Lovely. And could I just make a point, David, it's extremely bad manners 
to continually, continuously carry on calling a panel member by the incorrect name. I didn't. No, no. you've done it several times. I'm sorry. Ignorant. I think you should be apologising to the candidate there and everybody else. Here. Wow. All right. Let's have a look at my name wrong. It happens. I'm sure. I'm sure I, I don't mean it. I, I, oh, no, I'm you do serious. mean it. And it's ignorant. Right. So please don't. Should I ask, uh, read my mind. Could I ask the audience, uh, would you prefer a question on fracking or on immigration? Uh, could I see uh, hands up for fracking? Oh, <laughs> Alright, okay, fine. Fracking. Fracking first. Um, what have we not done yet? Maggie. Maggie for fracking. I think, again. <laughs> not slowly. <laughs> uh, the Scottish Greens have been consistently opposed to fracking. It is again part of an antiquated energy supply system that does not deliver a, a 21st century energy supply that we are looking for. The, the risks around security, at cost and pollution are far, far, far too great. We cannot have... Well, we, we, we desperately need much, much stronger regulation on, on that. And I hope to see Scotland frack-free. Yeah. <laughs> Agree? I, I completely agree with uh, what uh, Maggie just said. I have nothing to add. Excellent. Uh, George? I, I think it, it's a technology we do have to examine to see whether it can deliver any benefits to the uh, United Kingdom and indeed to Scotland. But if we are to go ahead, then it has to uh, be with a robust regulatory system uh, around it to make sure that all the environmental uh, issues are addressed before uh, any drilling takes place. Uh, and once we see the results of that, then decisions can be taken as to whether it actually is a viable uh, or indeed it's a worthwhile energy source to pursue. Uh, I don't think you can just rule it out completely and say, no, we're not, we're not going to touch this. Uh, if you look at uh, what's happened in the United States, uh, it has cut gas prices there by nearly uh, uh, three quarters of the prices down to about a third of what it was. So we shouldn't rule it out. Whether the regulation should be at EU level, uh, I'm not convinced it needs to be at EU level. I think it should be done by, um, by member states. It should be a, an issue of subsidiarity. Uh, and there should be guidelines laid down uh, at EU level as to, as to what the regulations should, con should contain at each member state level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jamie? Okay, well, I think the thing that's at stake here, the potential here is so important that we can't dismiss it out of hand because the potential is lower energy prices and it costing less to heat up. And that's super important. It's going to make a huge difference to the cost of living. So I think we owe it to ourselves to examine it. However, I think it's a complicated technical issue. I don't think it's quite as simple as being able to say yes and no. Um, it requires further analysis. And it, it's obviously not something that should be entered into all at once. Um, the only thing that I would say about it is that clearly it's going to be a trade-off. On the one hand, you have cheaper energy, and the other hand, you have the potential environmental cost to it. Now, this kind of trade-off issue is exactly the kind of issue that shouldn't be done at a European level, that should be done at a, at a national level, because it's perfectly legitimate for, for different countries to decide that that balance lies in a slightly different place. And trying to have a one-size-fits-all solution and imposing it for the whole of Europe um, I think would be the, the wrong way to go in this Well, the, I, I think there's room for nuance. Maybe it's just nice. I mean, not everything is a bumper sticker answer. I have both ways, though. Well, it's not both ways, it's a different way for every question. I mean, you can't expect me to have the same answer to every question. Oh, Rod. Um, are you anything else to add? Or? No, I'm done. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, just to add that, you know, uh, it's worthwhile making the point that there are no proposals which involve the use of fracking techniques in Scotland at this moment in time. Uh, and the Scottish Government is all for taking sort of a balanced, responsible and rigorous approach to this. Uh, and any any energy product, uh, project would have to go through the normal planning processes. But it's key, this, is, this is not a, an issue facing Scotland at this moment in time. But it would require to go through the normal planning processes and, and the consultations to see what the people of Scotland think and how it affects communities, etc. Okay. Uh, David, first of all, sorry for your response. Well, um, fracking, um, I think it's an economic necessity, but the thing is we have to be, be sure that it's not going to contaminate the water table. I'm concerned about that because obviously that's important for agriculture and, well, and for people's tap water. So, but um, yes, I think if, as long as that can be assured, I think it's necessary. And again, I, as I said before, short term until we have something better. Okay, Could I just ask Jamie if he agrees with George Osborne's father-in-law who said that fracking should only happen in Labour constituencies? 
Um, I, I hope that I'm not being too indiscreet here when I say that George uh, Osborne's father-in-law is completely mad. And no, <laughs> Of course. <laughs> <laughs> no relief, <right? laughs> Well, I think. Excellent, okay. Um, <laughs> You're not going to be sued for that. We, we shall move on. Um, so, uh, at the front, you had a question about immigration. Um, could you ask it again, if that's all right? Um, my concern is how do, does, do the future MEPs, how do they consider immigration on a Scottish level? And on a global level, how do we, how do you see it impacting on Scottish society? So uh, the question was, uh, how do the panellists, uh, how do the MEP uh, panellists, candidates, um, see immigration uh, affecting uh, Scotland and UK and uh, at a global level? Um, who shall we go to? Um, shall we go to Catherine first? Well, I think that um, immigration is an important issue. I think that... Uh, Migrants to Scotland have provided uh, a great wealth of talent and ability. I spoke to someone at the doorstep yesterday who came from Poland to work in my garage and was in said he loved Scotland. Could I you speak up a bit? I'm not sure the mic's sort of catching. I was out in the doors in Cowden Beef yesterday, it's a local by election, uh, there on the same day as the European elections. And I think that uh, I believe that freedom of movement is an important thing across the European Union. And I believe it because when I was 18, I went to work as a waitress in Germany. And because of doing that, I managed to be able to learn to speak German. The next year, I worked in a print factory in Germany and also worked in Italy. I think the freedom of movement for people like myself, I come from originally from North Lancashire. I now live in Fife. I was brought up in Wishaw. And for me to be able to have that opportunity, to be able to cross borders, go to another country and work. And this is the thing where I think it's all of the debate at the moment is, seems to be very confused. Uh, and also from uh, David's party, I think, is very virgin on, 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 on racism in the way that you have, uh, have placed that argument. I really do. I really object to the fact that you equate 27 million people able to come to Britain as the 27 million people are unemployed across the European Union, and instead of having policies you actually can try and help people get back into work. You put scare stories and try and and and, uh, and, and, uh, and 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 make people fearful. What we're about is saying across the European Union, the freedom of movement to work, and that's an important freedom. And I think that people like myself have benefited from it. There's two point is it two point two million Britons that work and live in other European Union countries. That's been a positive thing. As well as people coming, I think there's two point three four million people from the EU working. In, uh, in, in, in the United Kingdom. So for me, I think migration is an important issue and I fear that the stuff that David and his party have been putting out based in hate and prejudice is doing nothing to try and help us try and tackle some of the exploitation that people go under. If people are trafficked in this country, we should be doing more to help people. I'll do my and, best for your mind and, arrest. Um, I'm sorry, David, this is not something you should be flipping about. It's not flipping. No, I will no, be your mind arrest. No, it's a very, very serious, it is serious, serious issue, David. It is. About we, people we have the lyrics. David, David, we'll come to you in a moment. David, human okay. trafficking in Scotland. And the I'm way, not talking about human trafficking. Way, way, Catherine, way, uh, we, we are two minutes. Sorry, the way your leader spoke about it in that interview <laughs> on that radio programme when he just said something which was just absolutely outrageous, equating he didn't say human traffic, he said Romanians. That is absolutely objectionable. And I don't think that your party and the way they're putting things across is doing anything to tackle the real problems that we have about tackling, un tackling unemployment across the European Union. We can come back around the... Uh, Jamie. I think there are two parts to it. The first part is attitudes towards um, people in Scotland right now, and then the second part is attitudes towards this going forward. So on the first part of that, um, it's, it's very clear. I mean, there are no Romanian Scots, there are no Bulgarian Scots, there are just Scots, and they make a contribution to our culture, and that's a good, positive thing. Um, however, I think there is a second part of that. I don't think it ends there. I think it is reasonable to, um, to look at things going forward. And, I, and um, I think probably everybody in this panel agrees with um, restrictions on immigration at, at, at some level because of the practical implications and so on. So what I would say is that um, there are questions around, um, for example, when, when new member states come in, how long the, um, the transitional arrangements um, go on for. Um, and I think that's something that if, if new states were to join, we would want more robust um, transitional measures. Um, than we had um, last time round because of the, the, the practical impact on, on, on services and so on and also because um, it, 
it, um, having it in a controlled way seems like a reasonable democratic choice for people to make, as long as it never spills into something that's more unsavory, which I think is called it. But I quickly add to that. Um, Catherine mentioned first that there was a 900,000 um, skills shortage places. for IT. How do you expect mm -hmm. to fill them? I mean, if the jobs are that, where, where are you going to get the people to go? Okay, uh, we can come around to that. Uh, people who have already spoken can come to that uh, okay. afterwards in the discussion. But, uh, David, on to you. I know it's a yeah. topic close to your heart, but please, two minutes. Well, um, let's put it this way. I'm, you know, I speak several languages. I have businesses all over the world. I've lived all over the world myself. I speak everything from Arabic to God knows what, uh, French, Spanish, but um, I'm not a little Scotlander or a little Englander or whatever you'd like to, to think. Um, the problem we've got in this country, of course, we've got a social security system which has uh, got to be maintained. We have a health service that's got to be maintained. And if we don't uh, restrict mass immigration, uh, which is open door immigration with the European Union, we will simply not be able to run those. They will simply collapse. Now, um, that's UKIP are not the least bit interested in the racist argument. UKIP has the least. Let me finish. I was. I said I put your mind at rest. Uh, UKIP has the least racist immigration policy of all the parties. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why if you'd like to hear. Ours. We want a points-based system, like Australia. Not based on creed, religion, colour, or where you come from in the world. Points based on the basis of people we need to employ in this country. Now that's what the Australians do. It's perfectly fair. The European Union policy at the moment is any number of people from any part of Europe coming to the UK. That's not what we're proposing. And the problem they've got at the moment with the Open Door Euro European Immigration Policy... No. Let, let me just... Yes, it is, actually. That, well, let me finish. You, darling, you finish. Let me finish. Don't call me. Oh, I, uh, comrade, whatever. Comrade, let me just finish what I'm saying. Okay. We have, um, we have got to... We, well, let me just finish. We, we have an Open Door Immigration Policy in this country. The health service simply won't survive. If I was living in Eastern Europe, in a poor country... With, 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 with you know, no prospects for my family, I'd be on the first train to Great Britain. That's why I'd be. And the reason I'd be coming to Great Britain is because our currency is not the euro. This country is not bankrupt like Southern Europe. That's just two minutes. Right, right. But, but that's the reason. So okay. all I can say is we have, we have a non-racist, we don't care the colour or the creed or where people come from. And unfortunately, the European Union discriminates. It's only people in the European Union. So we don't care. We, we will have to leave it there. We'll people should come from India and from the Commonwealth. They will, that can't be less racist than any other party. Thank you. Uh, Tasmina, <laughs> on to you. Yes, a, a stark contrast you hear from me. Well, I absolutely believe um, in freedom of movement. It's one of the founding tenets uh, of, of the EU. And I'd like to look at this in two points. There's the EU and then there's the, the Westminster position. So absolutely in favour of free movement in people who contribute economically, uh, to Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom and indeed culturally uh, and traditionally in many ways that they, that they enrich our society and that's something that we should embrace and we must not fall foul of this continual scaremongering that we get from UKIP um, and such like who are telling us that we're being invaded by millions of people as Catherine said we pretty much have parity and uh, notwithstanding the scare stories that we're going to have an influx of Romanian Bulgarians when the rules were relaxed actually 4,000 of them left the country as opposed to staying here and no wonder if that's the kind of welcome they get from David and such like. Uh, that's my position in terms of the EU but fundamentally we have an immigration problem relative to Westminster's attitude to immigration and I never thought I'd see a day when we have to see vans like Go Home, which we see the UK border agencies vans that we saw across Scotland. That's what Scotland... By, that, yeah, yeah, David, yeah. I didn't interrupt you, and today's debate, you're going to let me speak. Carry on. Uh, where we had uh, these border agency vans saying, you know, Go Home. That's not Scotland that I know, and that's not Scotland that I know the people are in this room today, and the rest of Scotland will embrace. So Westminster's immigration policy is not working for the people of Scotland. We want to bring people into Scotland. They contribute to our economy. There are jobs they can take up, and indeed... We educate so many people because we have five of the top 200 universities here in Scotland. We educate them and send them home because the UK government policy doesn't allow us uh, to keep them here uh, to work and contribute, which is what they want to do. So I believe only with the powers of independence we can have an immigration policy that is fair, welcoming and allows people to contribute to the economy and make Scotland the pro prosperous, independent nation I know it can be. George, on to you. Well, I think uh, whatever David says, the language being used by his leader certainly would lead you 
to believe that uh, he is very uncomfortable with immigration uh, into the United Kingdom. And indeed, the singling out of Romanians in the, the interview uh, with LBC uh, last week, I think, uh, just showed the mask slipping as to what they really think uh, on this issue. And what they're doing, of course, is playing in people's concerns and anxieties and trying to, to build it up into a populist vote that, that, uh, for, for this election. Uh, and, it's re and it's very similar to what's been done in France through Marie Le Pen and Gert Wilders in, in Netherlands as well. And we must do everything to fight against that view of the world. Uh, our party is very, very clear. Uh, freedom of movement, allied to the single market, is absolutely essential. Uh, if you look at some of the studies that have been done, it shows quite clearly that the uh, huge influx of immigrants into the United Kingdom, if they're actually contributing far more in terms of taxes and, co and contributing to our society than they take back out in terms of any kind of support, whether it's welfare or whether it's benefits. So it's a good thing for UK PLC, it's a good thing for Scotland as well. I think the real question, uh, in some ways, uh, moving just on to, to, to the Scottish situation, is that we've had a declining population until recently in Scotland. Uh, a real challenge as to how we actually uh, increase the working population so that we can afford the taxes and the pensions and, and benefits going forward. It's a real challenge for Scotland. We've levelled out now after quite a number of years of, of declining population to where the, the population's levelled out. But it does seem to me that there is a real challenge there to explain why during a time of, of huge numbers of, of people coming to work from the European Union and the United Kingdom, more haven't actually stayed in Scotland and contributed to Scotland going forward because we need them. George, that's two. Oh, I'd love to we need, that. them, we need them to contribute to, to the pensions of future generations of Scots and that's a major challenge going forward for Scotland. Thank you. Two minutes. Thanks. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, I am an immigrant. I was born and brought up in Zimbabwe. I moved here 16 years ago and I cannot imagine making any other country my home. As William McIlvenny once said, Scotland is a mongrel nation and we should be rightly proud of that. Not only are the Scots made up of people from all over the world, but Scots have also travelled and settled all over the world. And I think that, that's something that we, we must not lose sight of. U UKIP's claims, David's claims this evening are a dog whistle. And I think Tasmin is absolutely right that, that you know, immigrants go home, we come in to get you vans, are an utter disgrace. That was a concern to me, I heard. Not to do with the UKIP. We opposed them. Can come to it. I think I, I, I'm very proud to be here at, uh, as a member of a party, of the only party I think represented on the panel tonight with an open borders policy. I think it's, it's something very, very clear. I immigration is, is always has been a, a, a benefit to, to Scotland. Just to give you a, 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 a brief example, if, if I may, a friend of mine was recently in, in, in a hospital in a coma rectal ward, not a very nice place to be, and one of the cleaners came in, who, he was from Portugal. He had been, he, he was in Scotland for a year, maybe two, to work, to, to earn some money because he wanted to finish building his house in Portugal, he was then going to go back. Now, we've not paid for his education, we're not going to be paying for his pension. That is a, that is a good thing. But if people want to come here and settle, well, why should they not? Yeah, you know, I think I, as an immigrant, I pay Great taxes, point. I contribute Great. to national, my, my national insurance, I contribute to you know, maintaining the roads, maintaining infrastructure, and I'm not one of the immigrants that under UKIP's policies would have been allowed in. And I think, you know, Geopolitically, we need to we need to look at this. We, we put up borders in, in this way as economic levers, and we cannot continue to do that. It is not good for our economy, and it's certainly not good for our culture. I understand that some panelists may wish to uh, come back on that. So, uh, David, you've got something. Just very quickly, you know, I hear this twaddle all the time about um, the health service. Quite frankly. Why a country that used to export doctors and nurses throughout the world are stealing doctors and nurses educated at great expense by third world countries and bringing them here and leaving those countries without because it's cheaper to import them than to educate them is an absolute disgrace. And it's an absolute load of nonsense. Every time I hear this argument, it's twaddle. Absolutely twaddle. And if we need more people... We should have family-friendly policies to, to encourage people to have more children. 
but it's very expensive to have children. Okay, with well, Emily, it's come very back expensive. That. Any of you who have had children, there's not a lot of people maybe here who have. They are expensive. Yeah. Things okay. Well, 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 let's get uh, real. Okay. Well, so you might have done, but well, well, tells me. Yeah, well, children. Yeah, but well, well, David. Uh, David. Uh, what else? There we are. Tells me now. Uh, David, I, I've got four, and I'm sure you'll forgive no, me. No, there you are. Then you're quite expensive. Well, well, I'm sure you'll forgive me at stopping at that amount and not leave me solely responsible for continuing the population of Scotland. Do your best. We, immigration is very important, uh, very important to Scotland, and you know I simply don't agree with with any of what you see in actual fact, particularly given that you're a party of anti-devolution. Never mind anti-immigration. I'm not a party of anti-devolution. You, I wish, want me to that. you wish to strip Scotland of all of the progress no, we we've don't. made via our Scottish Parliament Absolutely in terms of free not. education, in terms of free prescriptions, Total in not. terms of in terms of a national health service. Total so not. I think we'll take no lessons from you in terms of your yes, vision. Yes, accused everybody who do not agree with them of being unpatriotic. Chair Mayor, well, thank you. David. Yes, uh, we'll take no lessons for you in terms of a forward-looking vision for you Scotland. Take no lessons for anyone. <laughs> That's your problem. Did the UK um, 2010 manifesto not uh, say that it would uh, retain the Scottish Parliament but as a grand committee of MPs? Is that not um, yes. rid of devolution? Yes. Well, I, I'm, quite frankly, it seemed like a reasonably good idea. Well, the idea, idea, well let me finish. Doesn't mean you well, you didn't, let, you didn't let me finish, but I'll, I'll go through wow, the chair. Right, I'll, I'll go through the chair. Okay, Thanks. Okay, okay so, but basically, the, 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 it was thought... Uh, by UKIP that it might have been a better idea instead of having a set of M M e MSPs here and, uh, M e and MPs in London that it would be better that the MPs the Scottish MPs sitting in Westminster once a month come up to Edinburgh and sit as the Scottish Parliament that was a reasonable and sensible suggestion a lot of people still agree with it it's saving an awful lot of money there's even a lot of people chucking money about it, expenses and we see what the SNP and Mr. Mr. Salmon's golfing expeditions to the United States seem to cost us a great deal of money. Okay, Perhaps it was a sensible points. idea. David, the taxpayers might agree with it. David, we might, we might respect your views if you and your, your party leader and the rest of your MEPs published your, your expenses. expenses. And do you publish yours? Oh, uh, really? I think, uh, does anybody apart from, uh, well, do Maggie, uh, Catherine or uh, Jamie have anything to contribute to the current discussion? I think the, the first thing on, uh, that George alluded to, that Nigel Farage refused on that radio programme to commit to doing what Labour MEPs have done. And I well, they haven't all, but David. Liberal, and I believe the SNP and I believe the Conservatives too all publish their expenses in a transparency form. We do it every quarter. They're all about the same. We do it voluntarily. And the only group does not do this. Not it's your group, anymore. David. Neil. So I would suggest that you so David, can you please let us know? Duck I got a commitment here tonight that you will do what the SNP, what the Liberals and what the Conservatives do in terms of transparency. Well, I know I will be. But I can tell you one thing, that I, I would take no lectures from the Duck House Brigade and all the rest of it on ben, expenses. And Mr. Sam in his golfing ben, expeditions to the United can States. Can I okay, say okay. It, uh, and the Labour Party, David, David, where can I start? The UKIP individual from the northwest of England has a leaflet out saying he supports the privatisation of the NHS. Do you support that? Do Certainly you? not. He must be an idiot. Well, it's all on Twitter. Isn't well, it? It's all nuttal. Every part of it. Well, in the northwest well I think you're wrong. No, I'm not sure. He, well, then he's wrong. And, well, and well, it's so. so can I just he's wrong. It's simple, simple as that. Can, can I just confirm? Absolutely wrong. Simple can I just confirm you're saying that the deputy leader of UKIP is wrong on well, that issue? If he said that, yes, he is. Okay. Um, <laughs> Jamie, and then on to Maggie, and we'll move on. Then, then, then okay. I'll come back. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you had enough. <laughs> Would you rather? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on the next one. Okay, uh, Maggie and Tasmina. Uh, finish just, off. Just a couple of things on, on, on that. Firstly, <laughs> no MSP has ever gone to jail for fraud. Um, Yet. <laughs> the, the, no SNP minister yeah. has ever resigned in the extensive scandal. Question of time. You David, please. MPs please. have been jailed. I think j just just an interesting statistic for you. 0.6 of the of the prison population at the moment. 0.6 percent are your are, are Romanians. Nine percent of UKIP MEPs have been jailed for fraud. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. There were ex MEPs and. Tasmina, and then we will move on. On, on moral uprightness by a party that 
not only has expense scandals, you know, you know they didn't even take the parliament. You mean you've forgotten the duck houses and the boats? You've forgotten all that? We've all heard about the duck houses. Good God. Okay, tells me that, and then we shall move on. I, I have to say that it's choice that we've moved on to the question of expenses when the gentleman to my right here of the UK is seeking your seeking your vote to elect him to a European Parliament he doesn't believe in yeah. and won't even sit in to represent you. Oh, I will Never sit in it. Expenses. And I will tell you all the scandals David, David, and all the wasted David, money David, that they won't David, tell you please. about. David, but, but, Thank you. But I think Thank it's you. important that we look beyond um, the uh, immigration policies of UKIP and ask them what they actually intend to do for Scotland in the European Parliament. I'd be delighted your, to tell you. What, 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 what is your position on the things that matter very dearly to the people of Scotland? We which are, which are if, if you finish my question, you might be able to answer it. Uh, which, are, which are no tuition fees, no prescription charges in NHS, which means absolutely everything to us that's free at the point of need, and free personal care for the elderly. What's your position on all of those issues, David? Well, I think that might take a bit of time. <laughs> Would you? Could, uh, an, an answer to what might be nice. I can answer, do it very quickly. Could, could, okay, I'll give you we'll be fighting. 20 seconds. Seven. UKIP will be fighting in the, and in fact we're going to do very well in this election, and we're going to do it as a springboard to get into the Scottish Parliament. We will have a lot of MSPs, and we will have MPs from Scotland before England do, perhaps, because there are a lot of old constituencies here that are fed up to the back teeth and would like to see common sense. That is 20 seconds. I hear George has a snippet of something to that. Yeah, oh, I, just, I just think it's interesting, Tasmina, criticising... Uh, the UK MEPs for going to Parliament they don't believe in and watch your boss. The SNP MPs go to Westminster for Parliament they watch your boss and they don't believe in. Well, George, I, 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 no, no, there I is an answer. No, there is. I, I think need to answer that. I need to answer that, answer that point. It's only don't fair. Ask, please don't ask me a question. It's only fair that I answer that. Oh, that point. is. But please, nobody else ask SNP anybody any questions. <laughs> the SNP MPs that go to Westminster go to Westminster to speak up for the people of Scotland and indeed they attend important votes that matter to the people of Scotland unlike the Labour MPs that can't even turn up for the bedroom tax vote. So let's be clear, I'm talking about MEPs that go to Europe under UKIP's banner that do nothing, I repeat, so nothing, do the same as you do nothing for the people of the United no, Kingdom. Right. I've made oh, my point clear. They're in Parliament, they're voting for the people of Scotland, and that is what they're voting for. Did you think that when you were all right with you, Tory? That's the job, the Tory, uh, that's the job uh, they're being paid to do in their campaign. Do you remember the, the Tory party, a right wing Tory party member? Did you believe the same thing, Tasmina? I do actually have a, a question which may follow on from that, uh, so we will be moving on. Um, it's to all of the panellists. Um, when was the last time you made a U-turn, and is it wrong for politicians to be seen to be making U-turns, or is that, in fact, um, maybe this is a, a loaded question, uh, a sign of being willing to change your mind and uh, follow the evidence? Uh, George. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess uh, one of them, uh, uh, where our party has moved, uh, is some um, nuclear power. That we just discussed it earlier. Uh, we were quite firmly against nuclear power. Uh, but when you're confronted by the choices and the science, which says actually you did, you do need nuclear at the moment as part of the mix, then our party has actually moved on that one. And I think it's a sensible way forward, and, and it's about listening to the scientists and, and what the options are. Because until we discover the next great breakthrough in energy production, we are we are we are stuck with with that unfortunate fact. Okay, uh, I think we'll just uh, proceed along the panel. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Maggie? Thanks. Um, I, I, speaking on, on behalf of the Scottish Greens, I think there are two things I, I, would, I would say here. Um, the Scottish Greens used not to take a position on independence, and I think that, that's, that's something that we, we decided several years ago that we would, we would support independence because we, we see it as the only way of delivering social, uh, social justice for Scotland. Um, the other thing is, um, when, I, when I joined the Scottish Greens uh, quite a few years ago, um, we had a policy against a uh, policy in favour of homeopathy, and that's something that I, I fought very hard against, and we've got it removed. So I think you know th there is very very clear evidence of parties having mixed histories and and changing, and whilst some some changes in in, in some parties may be palatable. Um, to, to some others or not, but I, I think you know. I, I, per personally, I, I always take a, a principled position on things, and I've yet, having been a councillor for seven years, I've yet to change my mind. Charles yeah. I think the independence question offers a classic example of how we've seen people move um, from political beliefs they've had 
to putting at the paramount of those the paramount um, importance in relation to those beliefs where Scotland should stand on an international stage. And you know, the, the Yes campaign in itself, and I'm, I'm privileged to be a board member of that, has seen people come from many political parties and none, uh, and created within those new movements, be it Labour for Independence or Liberal Dems, or even some Conservatives that we have who are in favour of independence. I think it's a sign of moving times. I think it's a sign of keeping up with the needs of the people of Scotland. And it's entirely correct that you know people are entitled uh, to have those views if they think that's in the best interest of the people they're seeking to represent. Thank you. David? Well, wow, Tasmina is the queen of u turns She's been in more political parties than, uh, than anybody else in uh, Scotland, and she's even been in two political parties at the same time, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, which is quite some, some, uh, some U-turn. Uh, yes, I believe in u turns I think if you get things wrong, you should fess up and you should say, I made a mistake. That's what sensible people do. Uh, anybody else who doesn't is an absolute idiot. We've watched uh, Cameron and you've watched uh, Clegg turn on the, the head of a pin because they, they've made horrible mistakes they can't uh, admit to. Uh, quite frankly, um, you know, Nigel Farage, if he's made a mistake, he turns around and says it. He's, he said some of our previous manifestos were rubbish, and quite frankly, he's, he was quite right. Some of them were rubbish. And, uh, you know, at least he has the guts to say that. And I think that's why daily record readers all over Scotland, I give you the daily record, not usually you think they're supporting, uh, supporting of UKIP, are, are telling us that uh, UKIP are going to get the same. There you go. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, Catherine. Yeah, we've all been lobbied, uh, I think, as candidates uh, by very right-wing uh, Christian group. And I, um, in this questionnaire, it was a question about homeschooling. And I looked at that, and I've always been supportive of the parents' right to choose uh, how their child, child is schooled. But on, future, on, on reflection on this, I do believe that we also have to make sure that the rights of the child are upheld. So if I'm going from a position, <laughs> so if I'm going from a position of saying absolutely homeschooling, absolutely, I, I made me actually think really seriously about that particular issue, and that we must ensure that the rights of the child and the child to have a, an educate has to be upheld. So I kind of I've switched my my position from being very pro homeschooling to being uh, with a caveat that uh, the rights of the child have to be upheld. Good for you. Thank you. And I uh, now on to Jamie. Well, I quite like the John Maynard from uh, Keynes quote, which is, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? Exactly. Uh, having said that, this is my first election campaign, so I haven't had the time to make any returns yet, I'm thankful to say. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Tasmina, would you like to come back on anything? And David's point was simply to say that um, I was born into a Conservative household. My father was the first Asian regional councillor in the whole of the United Kingdom. I'd been delivering leaflets from since the age of seven. And yes, I had the opportunity then to see what was necessary for the people of Scotland to, to advance the case, uh, which was one of independence. And there are many people that went before me who moved towards um, the party that supports independence, the true party of independence with the Scottish National Party. Many more that have followed and very many more to come. Um, okay, thank you. Well, we'll be moving on. That was a bit of a, a personal uh, response, thank I think. Um, so, uh, we do... Yes, up the back. Uh, two questions, if I David, could you please explain how fusion of hydrogen removes radioactive waste? Not a clue, oh, boy. Not a clue. And to Maggie and Tasmina, please, both of you would sit in the Green uh, Party within the European Parliament. How shall I choose which of you to give my vote to? Right, well, you want me to answer this? Uh, well, well, the first question. Yeah, just the first one. How do I remove what from where? How would the... How would the... It's fusion. Yes. It's taking heavy elements and fissioning them from this fission. Yeah. You said that fusion would get rid of... Uh, no, no, pan, no. Um, um, well, well I'll explain what I know, okay, which is not a lot, but I'll tell you what I know. Um, I, I have a friend who works at all. The atomic weapon establishment. I, I've made a great deal of. I, I take an interest in, in, in obviously power production, and he explained to me a man who is not top. I mean, I was a Latin and Greek man, not a physics chap. But anyway, whatever. Uh, quite frankly, um, I understood as best I could, and as from what he tells me, that nuclear waste from current reactors can be used as fuel for um, uh, fusion reactors. You've completely misunderstood. Well, I probably did, and you're probably right, and I don't know. But from what I understood, and he is a very, very bright man, and um, I, I'm not going to say who he is, but let, let's put it this way. He's probably more likely to know about it than you are, or me, or anyone else. Okay, like well, he, he does know his stuff. But, oh, we'll, leave it, we'll, leave it, we'll leave it there, David. Say, is it? David, we'll leave it there. David. It's temporary measure. Let's hope it works. It's a good idea. 
Okay. Uh, Maggie, on to you. Okay, I think, I think that, that, that there are a few, a few things here. Um, firstly, I would say the Scottish Greens have very, very distinct positions, uh, different to the SNP, on, on several things. We would not sign up to NATO. We see it as a Cold War relic. It is not delivering peace and security to all in, in the way that perhaps people in the, in the 70s, 80s and 90s thought it might. Um, I think we need to be very, very clear on what, what the future of international cooperation is, and it is not in nuclear alliances. I think I was the first politician in Scotland to call for a living wage, and my SNP colleagues in Edinburgh Council laughed at me. They said no, they will, would not do it. That, that's true. You can go and look at the record, doesn't mean, if you, if, if you disagree. It's, I'm going to say it, add, add another point. It's in, in, in our minutes. Um, and the SNP have, have uh, not put that into legislation. They had the opportunity to do so just a couple of weeks ago, and they haven't done that, hiding behind European directives. France has done it. France has done it on, on a whole range of different things. And, you know, so it's, they, there's no barrier there. They, they, they could have been a way to, to, to get that in, into Scottish legislation. I think the, 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 other, the other point I would make is after every... European election, there are always negotiations around groups, and we have the Scottish Greens have a very, very clear policy. We will not sit in a sit in a group that will bring in any austerity measures. Now that discounts some of our green colleagues in Europe. So that 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 for us is a very, very clear red line because austerity is destroying communities across across Scotland and across Europe, and that that that's that's one thing that we will be very, very. You know, that, that, that is our, one of our red lines when we go into negotiations. We will not sit with a pro-austerity party. Okay, uh, Tasmina, and then we will move on because that was just for those two candidates. Thank you. Yes, yeah, specifically in relation to the living wage, the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to in every job over which the Scottish Government has control and um, the employees paid at uh, a living wage. In terms, to, in terms of the European position, this is all details, uh, detailed in Article 3 of the Posting of Workers Directive. And the position is where the living wage um, in a country is above the minimum wage set for that country, you cannot pay the living wage. It's contrary to EU law. However, in saying that, um, it is absolutely the SNP's policy to drive for a living wage to be paid across Europe um, and certainly in Scotland. That would be one of the things we'll be fighting for in the European Parliament. Um, in terms of the choice between uh, myself and Maggie, in terms of current polling, which you've seen a uh, poll out today even um, in the Daily Record, polling indicates that it is a direct choice between Nigel Farage and who would be his representative in Scotland. For all of you, this gentleman here, David Coburn, or myself, and that is a choice that faces you on Thursday. Okay, uh, despite what I said, uh, we do have a point of information I would describe it from, Catherine. Yeah, I, th I think it's to be very clear that the Scottish National City and the European Free Alliance Group of 13 MEPs currently, and then they're in coalition with the Greens. And at the moment, the Greens, what do they have across the Europe, Maggie? They've got what, for? 45. 45. Yeah. So, and, and the Greens in two different groups. Yeah, the, in, in the main Green EFA yeah. group. It sits together and so just to explain that that, that that after the elections obviously the EFA group needs seven representatives from different countries to form a group so there's there's different things that are going on in negotiations that will have to take place but I just think you need I want to clarify that point to you sir okay uh, Chris um, particularly in my work with asylum seekers and refugees I've seen how the European Court of Human Rights can stop people being scapegoated by political friends mm -hmm. Now, there are a number of parties who are sitting here today, and I know that the European Court of Human Rights has fallen out of favour uh, publicly for various different reasons. What safeguards would you see needing to be put into place to ensure that people cannot be scapegoated by politicians in the way that the, um, well, the new Immigration Act of 2014 appears to be seen and trying to do? Uh, so the question was what, uh, what the EU would do to prevent scapegoating of uh, of, sorry, my mind's gone blank. Of uh, traffickers, traf traffickers, refugees. Refugees. Okay, my bad. Um, Maggie, on to you first. Okay, I think I think that the the Court of Human Rights is very very important. I think anybody who, who seeks to water that down is well, you know, goes fundamentally against everything I believe in. Given what I've already said about on, on my position on on immigration, I think what we what we need to be absolutely clear here is Europe should welcome those and, and be hospitable towards those who are seeking refuge. That, that's something that, you know, 
we, we have the resources. It's not a question of, oh, we can't afford it. We have the resources to support this. And the, the, moral, the moral imperative there, for me, uh, overrides, overrides all, all else. I think we need to be, we, we, we absolutely need to have the, the, those human rights enshrined a, across Europe. And I think we, we, we need to strengthen them. If there is scapegoating, you know, do we need to start looking at penalties for, 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 for that, kind of, that kind of approach, which criminalizes human beings? And I, as far as I'm concerned, that's just unacceptable. Just a, a, an interesting note, which, which some people in the room might not know, um, there, were, there are uh, representatives from parties on this panel who voted against uh, an anti-human trafficking directive in, in, in the last European term, um, sitting down that side of the table. <laughs> okay, uh, George, I think we'll move on to you next. Two minutes. Well, firstly, the European Court of Human Rights, of course, has nothing to do with the European institutions. It was funded. It is funded, yeah, yeah but it was, set, it was set up way back after the Second World yeah, War, and the UK was the leading, was the, lead, yeah. the country who led the way in setting up, which is something we rightly should be proud of, uh, mm -hmm. because it reflects uh, our values and reflects uh, the concerns at that time. And therefore, I do think that any attempt to undo, the, the legislation is now enshrined in our law, and it's enshrined in Scottish law as well, uh, and any move to, to either water that down or, 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 or re, uh, reverse that legislation, I think should be resisted. Uh, and certainly any suggestions inside the coalition government uh, at a UK level that that, would do, that should happen, and there's plenty of pressure coming from those in the right of the Conservative Party, has been firmly resisted by us in the coalition, and made sure that we stick by the human rights that we... Uh, enshrined when we set the court up, and of course, if you do, if you did, uh, if the United Kingdom did decide to go down that road, what kind of signal does it send to the likes of the Russia and the Putins of this world, who are persecuting uh, those who are, are uh, and those uh, gay people, uh, anyone who has uh, who is uh, a, of, of a different uh, a different uh, a race? Uh, we need to stand by uh, the enshrinement of the, the European Court of Human Rights and the European uh, the Human Rights Act that was, that was put through by the Labour government uh, last time round. We supported that, we're defending it, and we will continue to do so. Okay, um, thank you very much. George, uh, on to Jamie. Okay, well, I think there are two questions that are actually very different. And the first is, do you believe in human rights? And the second is, do you believe in the Court of Human Rights? Um, uh, unequivocally, of course, the answer to the first is yes. And um, we need domestic institutions to um, protect those, and we need to make sure that the laws are enshrined. Um, the answer to the second, however, I think is more problematic, because it brings in the, uh, the anti-democratic imbalance point that um, I was referring to earlier, which is the point that if there is a, um, a, a, a ruling or a rule through, coming through that institution that is, um, that is unpopular, then who do, you, um, who do you get rid of and who do you blame for it? And I think that's an important test for legitimacy. Now, I, I, your point, I suppose, I would guess would be, well, what do you do where the people make a wrong decision? How do you put it beyond um, the reach of the people? But I don't think it's a good idea to purposefully use um, institutions that are not reflective of, of democratic will as a bulwark against um, popular opinion that you might not like. Um, and therefore, my my preferred um, my preferred solution to this would be rules at a at a domestic level with a process for, for changing them if they become um, obsolete, albeit that you put up barriers so they can't be changed on a whim. David first, and then Catherine can come on to you. Well, I refer to Ravi Burns, who said, "Britain be to Britain true only by British hands shall British wrongs be righted." Um, I'm a great unionist, so quite frankly, I think these things should be decided in Britain. Um, all the other countries of Europe have been monstrous dictatorships up until the very recent past. And quite frankly, well, uh, it's true. I mean, I'm not that old, but I remember seeing General Franco marching into the bull ring in Madrid and everyone getting up and giving Roman salutes. I'm not that old, so that's pretty scary stuff. Uh, most of the people in Eastern Europe, I was doing business in Eastern Europe before the wall came down, I can assure you that the, the communists there were not Democrats. Um, I, I think this European nonsense has just gone too far. France is not a, um, a, a, a democracy in the way I would consider a democracy to be correct. Quite frankly, I believe that uh, British, British laws and, and British values should be decided in the United Kingdom and nowhere else. 
Okay, thank you, David. Uh, Tasmina, on to you. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. An excellent one. I mean, I work in, a, in an immigration law practice, and we're, uh, we, we look after asylum seekers on a daily basis, and the language around asylum seekers concerns me greatly. Let's just remember who asylum seekers are. These are people fleeing countries because their lives are in danger, and they, they require to be treated with respect, not degraded uh, by many of the powers that be in this country. And certainly with, um, with the powers of independence, when we have all of immigration and asylum uh, within our control, we would hope to enact a system that is fair and just and gives people, treats people the compassion that they absolutely deserve and uh, brings to an end the terrible treatment that they have and uh, closes Dan Gable and ends forever any dawn raids. Did you believe that? You are a conservative right winger. Thank you very much. Tasmina? Uh, Catherine, finally on to you. Yeah, on, on the question of human rights, obviously you know that the Court of Human Rights is not an EU institution, but in saying that, that uh, you cannot join the European Union without having committed to the, to, to the principles around uh, the Convention on, on Human Rights, which is, I, I, I believe, a good thing. And I feel that we've got into a situation where, on one hand, the Conservatives are talking openly about withdrawing from the, the Convention on Human Rights, are they not? But if you do that, then you're automatically withdrawing from the European Union because you cannot be a member of the European Union without committing to those uh, values. And now we've got uh, human rights enshrined, I think, rightly so, within Scots law and within uh, the UK more broadly. And I, and I, I totally disagree with, with David's perspective about... Uh, I think it's important that we brought into the democratic home Spain, Portugal, Greece, and then the countries from should... Central... You just said... No, I didn't. You just described I said, it. I, no, I said that they... Can, no, I just said David, it. Catherine, we Catherine, should let our decisions be influenced by them. David. Let me finish, David. I think it's very, very important, and that's why I said at the beginning about how this is a peace process. How do you put a price on peace across 28 countries bringing together? If we didn't bring the countries of formerly Eastern European countries into the democratic fold, we would have 10 Ukraines in our borders at the moment. That's something I certainly do not uh, do not want. And I believe that bringing the countries, formerly communist countries, back into the democratic fold was a great exercise in 2004 in democratic uh, responsibility but also in peace building it was really important but on your question human rights is, is sorry I see 20 is the countdown in a little iPad over there that uh, I think human rights is, is essential within what we do and I think it's very important thank you very much uh, we are very rapidly running out of time um, oh dear there are lots of questions. Um, I did, I'm sorry, I did say to that gentleman at the back that I would see him. So, uh, brief, a brief question, please. Uh, and brief uh, answers. Uh, one of the candidates planning on the responses to the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. I mean, that, I mean, you guys should be right off of it. That concern is that strength of sovereignty. Well, absolutely. I'm also very concerned about the health service as well, because it affects the health service. You know that. So the question is, I believe, uh, how the panellists would uh, respond to the transatlantic trade partnership, if I've got the name correct. Um, shall we start in the opposite order from last time? So, uh, Catherine, to you. Yeah, um, I think the whole debate around peace is important. I think that uh, the, it's more than a trade agreement. It's about creating a single market across the Atlantic. Um, and saying that... The negotiations are happening, no decisions have been made. What I um, want to see is the issue around investor state dispute resolution. I think that should not be part of the TTIP negotiation. I think that social standards, health standards and consumer rights should be more firmly embedded in it. I think there's an issue about transparency with the negotiation. Um, but I'm saying this already, the standards organisations across the European Union, there are three. Across America, there's one in every state. And, and as well, on top of that, the federal systems. Already, those standards organisations are informally coming together and hope to have a memorandum of understanding by the end of, uh, end of the year. That's a good thing in trying to create, take, take in product safety and these kind of issues to work together. But the TTIP negotiations, I think, have to be more open. And I really do think at the moment people are right to criticise. And that's why I think we have to have a much more open and transparent uh, process. I work in consumer rights and the consumer organisations are very concerned about the way, even though there's social dialogue now happening, 
it's a, it's a bit like, you know, you, you're given some information, but it's a bit too late. So I think we have to improve on that. So I hope in the next Parliament, the negotiations will go on with those caveats, because I think the potential at the end of the day, the goal that we could get, something across the Atlantic, which is fair and transparent and robust, is something that we should try and work towards. Sorry, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, Tasmina, on to you. Uh, yeah, of course these negotiations are set to go on for a considerable length of time and I agree with very much um, with what Catherine has said there and we do, we do have concerns in, in terms of um, the current negotiations. We must make sure that they don't undermine um, any of the, the things that we have brought out of the EU in terms of standards of health, environment and workers' rights. So they must be at the forefront of all negotiations. But I would add though, however, uh, with the powers of independence standing alone as Scotland negotiating on behalf of Scotland, we'd have a much greater say in how those negotiations uh, padded out as uh, opposed to being part of an increasingly um, uninvolved United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Tasmina. Um, da sorry, David, on to you. Okay, well, this should be decided by the British Parliament. It should not be decided by the European Union. We can work out a much better deal with us, ourselves, but with the United States. Um, it also affects very much the City of London, which is one of our major money earners, and also Edinburgh, which has a great number of jobs and financial services, very important. Um, also, it does have an effect on our health service because there are certain things about having monopoly, monopolies on health care uh, that are very worrying, so we should be watching that. This sort of thing should be decided by Great Britain. We do a better job doing that with the United States because we are on the same wavelength as the United States, which cannot be said for a socialist Europe, which quite frankly is sclerotic and dying on its feet. Sorry? Didn't get that one. Uh, so, Jamie, on to you. Well, I think a free trade deal with the United States and with the North Atlantic would be a, a great thing because there are few initiatives that can, on the one hand, give us um, the, give, give Scottish companies the chance to expand abroad and export more and grow larger, and on the other hand, deliver um, cheaper um, products and more choice to consumers at home. I think this is one area where we have to keep on pushing very hard. When we joined the European Union 40 years ago, it was a, 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 a massive positive force um, for, for, for free trade. Um, now it's, it's less constructive in that capacity. Um, and the frustration um, I think there is with the, the, the European negotiation process is that it hasn't delivered these types of trade deals quick enough. It's delivered some, it's delivered a trade deal in the South Korea recently. Um, but what we need to be seeing is free trade deals with, um, with India, with China, with the, the, the emerging markets across the world so that Scotland and Scotland's um, businesses can truly take an internationalist position um, to create more high-skill, high-wage jobs here at home. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, and ultimately, George, and you. Okay. Uh, the uh, free trade deal with uh, USA, uh, the talks are really important. I think there are tremendous opportunities, but there are also some threats that are contained within it. Uh, the Parliament uh, now has the power under the Lisbon Treaty to veto, uh, to reject uh, uh, the trade deal. So we do have some substantial powers uh, on this matter. Uh, there are, I think, probably three red lines, but we need to be very careful around. One is that in the whole issue of investor state disputes and how that uh, finally pans out. Uh, there's a consultation by the Commission on this very, very issue because of the number of concerns that have been raised about uh, how that might affect provision of, of public services in, in European countries in the future. I think around uh, the imports, agricultural imports, there are some big issues around there as well that could have a huge detrimental effect on Scotland that we need to watch out. Uh, uh, very closely for as well. Uh, I think the final point I would make is that the reason why the EU is the right institution to, uh, uh, or why we need to support the EU is because uh, the likes of the United States and China uh, and India are not really interested in negotiating 28 separate free trade deals with 28 countries around Europe. When it comes to clout in the world stage, being within the EU, being part of the EU, gives us real clout. It gives us the ability to negotiate instead of doing 28 separate negotiations. And that's why we believe we're better off in the EU, not breaking it up as David and his party would have us do. Okay, uh, number eight, no. uh, you can, if you do have anything to say, you can uh, say it in your closing statement in a moment. Um, Maggie, finally, on to you. 
Thanks. Um, I, I think what we have in the current negotiations with TTIP and uh, other trade negotiations that are currently underway is not only the, the threat to weaken workers' rights, consumer rights that, that Catherine has, has, has spoken about, but also it's it's entirely anti-democratic. 80% of the, of the people involved in those negotiations are from corporate lobbyists. They are not democratically accountable people. And that is the problem. We need to move to a situation where trade negotiations are, are opened up by the parliament, not by the commission. And that, that, that's, that's a fundamental flaw in, in TTIP. And uh, as it stands, we, we, we will oppose it. Because what it does is it gives powers to corporations <laughs> We could be in the situations where corporation could could sue state governments for trying to do things that they have demo been democratically elected to do. Laws, rules put I implemented in, in national government legislation by by de the democratically elected and democratically accountable people. We cannot hand more power to multinational corporations. They've had far too much power, and it's destroying the lives of communities. It's destroying the lives of the ordinary people. We have to have democratic accountability of all of all of our negotiations within Europe. Uh, thanks to Maggie for that, and, uh, thank all, and thanks to all of you uh, for your questions. Uh, we are sadly now going to have to uh, ask the candidates for their closing statements, but uh, please, uh, hopefully the discussion will uh, continue upstairs in the bar uh, afterwards. Uh, I will certainly be there. Um, so we are going to do uh, closing statements in the uh, reverse order from uh, the opening statements, and so the first three will be Jamie, Maggie and George, uh, and uh, you have two minutes each. Uh, so Jamie, on you. Great. Well, I think this is an important election, and I think it's an important election because we really are at, at some kind of crossroads at this stage. And the options before us are these. We could go down um, David's road, which loops off and circles into the hills, um, and uh, which is um, eccentric, amusing, but um, it, it, difficult to see how it would actually deliver any kind of better deal for Scotland. Or we could go down the road that's um, more of a safe, the status quo road, um, which is what's been proposed by the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrat Party. And of course, at every election, they say, well, we're going we're to bring about these changes, but we've got all these elections historically to, to look back at. And although there has been a, a, a trajectory of change, it's been slight. And, um, and what I would argue is that the problems in Europe, the deficits that I spoke about, the financial deficit, the democratic deficit, are so great that we need more of that. Or we can go down the road offered by Tasmina, which is that we, um, which is that we break apart from the United Kingdom and then we go to Europe with one priority, which is to negotiate back entry into it. And the question is, what do you have to give up in order to achieve that? We know we have to give up some things, like Scotland's share of, of the UK rebate. And um, the question is, what else do we have to, uh, what else do we have to, to, to give up? And how likely is it that our partners are going to be willing to give us more money? Um, or um, surprisingly, uh, which I would say is the road that we should choose, um, we, 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 we aim for, um, for real significant change. We propose something different to what's been done before so that we've actually got a chance of getting it, which is the renegotiation followed by the referendum so that ultimately the people are the auditors over whether the deal is, is good enough. And then we achieve a Europe that is doing what it does well but not doing the things that it doesn't have to do, and bringing those powers back at home where they're democratically um, accountable. So that's the, the that's role that the government has offer. Thank you very much. Uh, Maggie, on to you. Two minutes. Thanks. We have to put democracy in the heart of Europe, not bureaucracy, and certainly not bureaucrats. People need to be at the heart of what Europe does to be included in decision making, to be treated with dignity and respect. We have to protect workers' rights across Europe, ensuring a decent pay, proper support for things like sickness, parental leave. We have to enshrine trade union rights for all and not let the bosses and private corporations control and wield power over our lives. Perhaps most of all, though, we have to send a very clear message that austerity is not working and that there is an alternative to the privatisation and cuts agenda of so many political parties. It is a disgrace that in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, people are resorting to food banks to feed themselves and still cannot afford to heat their homes. And my final point, if I may respond to the comments about polls and, and what the choice on, on Thursday is, the poll quoted today, the, 
when, when they asked the questions, the poll did not prompt for Greens. When people ask, when Greens are included in the list of who you will vote for, we, we consistently score above the vote threshold needed to, to elect Tasmina. So, if elected this week, I promise to fight for the rights of people, of workers, not bosses or bureaucrats. I will work for peace, for social justice, and an end to austerity. A vote for the Greens is a vote for a positive future of hope, the exact opposite to the politics of fear and division that we have suffered under for so long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, now on to George. Thank you. Two minutes. Well, the, the challenge, uh, I believe, uh, if I'm elected, is to continue the reforms that we uh, succeeded uh, in delivering in the last Parliament and build on them in the future. Reforms designed to make Europe more economically viable, to make it more competitive, to create jobs and lift it out of the economic recovery, uh, lift it out of the economic doldrums that it's been in over the last uh, number of years since the economic crisis. We've reformed the budget. We reformed the financial markets. Uh, we need to build on that with reform to the energy markets, reform to the services market, all of which will provide huge opportunities for creating jobs and economic uh, uh, prosperity in Scotland. I think the choice on Thursday is quite a simple one. Uh, if you uh, if you look at the choices between the parties, you have the SNP, who has priority is to break up Britain. If you look at UKIP, their priority is to break up the European Union. None of these will secure jobs mm -hmm. or economic recovery. The Liberal Democrats believe that staying in Britain, staying in Europe, <coughs> secures jobs and will secure the economic recovery. And I hope you'll vote for a party that believes we're better off in Britain and in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tasmina, you have two minutes. Uh, the European Union, of course, needs reform, and we are committed to that reform, to making the EU work better for the people of Scotland. At the moment, we're being represented um, at EU level by Westminster, and we're losing out. We're losing out on money for food banks, which we could have obtained, but the UK decided not to participate in that fund, which meant Spain got 500 million euros for their people who needed money. France got 443 million euros, and the UK got absolutely nothing. We've also lost out in the European Youth Guarantee, which the UK will not subscribe to, and the Globalisation Fund, which helps people get into employment and offer them money in times of hardship. So, there is a stark choice here between choosing a party that speaks for Scotland and only for Scotland and whose only priority is Scotland, George. And that is what the SNP will commit to, to speaking up for Scotland at every level, on every day of every week in the European Union. Thank you very much. Uh, David, you have two minutes. Okay, the EU is not democratic. It's not fit for purpose. Cameron will not be able to renegotiate a treaty with 28 different countries. It's absolute nonsense. He promised a referendum before. He's not going to, he didn't give it to you then. He won't give it to you now. And he's very unlikely to get elected in the next election. Um, the, uh, we need to protect our health service and social security system for an unlimited open door European immigration policy. It will not survive if we keep on going the way we are. Uh, UKIP offer a non-racist, uh, points-based, uh, well, if you might, immigration system along the Australian lines. Ours is less uh, racist because we let anyone in, not based on not based on colour, race, greed. It's based on geographical. Uh, thing. It's based on need. People we need for the economy. Um, Salmon will sell Scotland's oil and fishing industry to get a worse entry into Europe, complete with. Uh, Euro, and which I think will, I'm very sure, will bankrupt Scotland in a very short space of time, uh, as it has done Southern Europe. I don't think it suits us. And if we are broken up, broken up, we have broken away from our biggest market, which is England, which uh, we have had relations with for 300 years, satisfactory relations with a 300-year-old agreement with a good sound currency, and we've defended ourselves together and worked together in peace and in war. What's there not to like about that? Considering the people we've been fighting in, in those periods of war happened to the people, many of them, across the channel. So quite frankly, I don't see what Salmon's offering. He's not offering, he's not offering, well, you may laugh, but Salmon is not Salmon. offering uh, independence. He's offering rule from Brussels, and he's offering um, con financial control from Frankfurt. What is that to do with independence? That's not independence. It's just 
anti-English hatred. The, e, the SNP are not, are not a Scottish party. They are an anti-English racist party. Okay. Thank you very much, David. Uh, final uh, closing statements from Catherine. Thank you very much. Two minutes. Will Labour in this election stand with colleagues across Scotland, across the United Kingdom, across the European Union, standing in a common manifesto where we put jobs first to 27 million people across the European Union, who have said at the beginning, who are here, who are at this moment unemployed. The austerity programme has not worked. The right we have to reject that, and that's why it's important in getting a socialist group in the Parliament elected to put jobs first, to ensure that social protection is put first too, and that we do away with precarious work where people are put on uh, zero hours contracts and the like, which does nothing to help our economy or the needs of those people. So what I would say to you in these elections, it's vitally important that, uh, that I encourage as many of you to vote Labour in the elections because by voting Labour, we have a group in the Parliament of 195 people at the moment, which is the second largest group in the Parliament, and we can defeat the right, the European People's Party, a party which the Conservatives decided to walk away from and form an even further right party group and has no influence in terms of this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, parliament. And so we need to ensure that we put jobs, working people and a social agenda back at the heart of Europe. The European Parliament is a privilege to work with people from 28 different countries where our values are the same, where we have to fight against unemployment, where we have to fight for social justice and equality. And those values bring us together. And it would be a privilege again to represent Scotland in the European Parliament, to put those values back across and to ensure those values are delivered upon, not from the right, nor from the SNP, who didn't support the tax avoidance measures or support extension of maternity price, but only in the socialist group where you get a social Europe. So please vote Labour. Uh, thanks, Catherine, and thanks uh, to all of our candidates here tonight. Um, having come along and heard from them all, uh, hopefully you now will all be heading out to vote for Thursday um, for one or another. Um, <laughs> all of us. So uh, hopefully you have all enjoyed yourselves. Uh, we will be heading upstairs to have a chat and a few drinks and uh, to continue on the discussion, so please do join us. Um, if I could ask you all to take your glasses upstairs as you go, that would be a great help to everyone.